What does it mean to be a fool? What separates the ambitious from the imprudent, the bold from the stupid? If I were to guess, it would be the results of their actions. Those who succeed will be seen historically with admiration. We will speak of how they won against the odds. Those who fail, on the other hand, we will analyse their failure. Every detail of their fall, their soul forever tortured with the humiliation of defeat. Great men and women may one day fall, while those who have fallen may one day rise. I suppose it's all contextual who shall be remembered for what. You might think I'm referring to the pages of history books, to legends long lost to time, but the men and women I speak of are still very much here with us. The internet has given us the ultimate tool to act upon our free will, for through it we can write our own history books become legends in the eyes of those who witness us, to be admired from the comfort of our bedroom desk, or to be mocked. There could be no greater fruit of knowledge than the internet, for through it we can indulge every single desire we've ever had, know anything we could ever hope to know, and become something so much more than ourselves, or perhaps be swallowed, torn asunder and lost, by something so much more than ourselves. Today, we'll be looking at one such man, one such fool who bore himself, his dreams, and all that he was to the internet. A fable littered with ideas of grandeur, petty 2000s internet wars, and diapers. A tale of blue hedgehogs and red-haired chipmunks, of arrogance, of ambition, and of failure. An account of trolling, internet dudes swinging sticks at one another, and above all else, a man who followed his dreams, no matter how crazy, to the bitter end. The fable of one of the most infamous and interesting Sonic internet personalities ever to grace the web. Sonmanic, a knothole resident, I side tape, Rich Monk, or simply Richard Cooter. It's 1993, Bill Clinton's nearly a year into his first year as President of the United States. Classic movies like Jurassic Park, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Groundhog's Day, Demolition Man, and of course Mrs. Doubtfire have released or are going to be released soon this year. And of course, Sonic the Hedgehog is on top of the fucking world. By this point, Sonic 1 and 2 have already been released to major acclaim and success for Sega as a company. And it was the first real contender for a true rival to Nintendo's ever-popular Super Mario, and brought some real good competition to the market. He's fast, he's cool, he's blue, and his game's got some sick-ass soundtracks. 
Uh, by late 1993, Sonic CD was about to come out, and Sonic 3 and Knuckles was on its way early next year. However, outside the world of gaming, Sonic was also making his grand debut into the world of television, with not one, but two Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon series coming out within days of one another. The first of which being The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, which was a weird fever dream combination of Looney Tunes, trippy visuals, slapstick humor, and later to become a foundation for memes and YouTube poops to come in the not-so-distant future. The second cartoon, however, was titled simply Sonic the Hedgehog. This cartoon was different from the other, sporting its own cast of original characters and a far darker, more serious tone and setting, where serious villain Dr. Robotnik had won in his quest for world domination years ago. And now, Sonic and his pals, the Freedom Fighters, are now trying to stop Robotnik from further turning the rest of their animal kind into his robot slaves through robotization and destroying what little nature is left. The show wasn't afraid to go to gloomier plot scenarios or shy away from the dystopian setting even if the show was still a cartoon in much the same vein as shows like uh, The Batman or the later Gargoyles did. The main cast of characters were interesting and fun to follow, all bouncing off of one another in a natural fashion. The show also allowed characters to both show weakness and vulnerability. Even Sonic gets character development when he has a dream about not being quick enough to save his friend, in particular, Princess Sally Acorn, or when he meets up with his uncle Chuck, who has been roboticized and lives as a constant reminder of what could happen to him and all of his friends. New character Bunny Robot has had three of her limbs roboticized, but she uses those scars of war as a means of fighting back against Robotnik. Sally Acorn, once princess to the ruler of Mobius, fights not just for her people and loved ones, but to avenge her father who was thrown into the void years ago by none other than Robotnik. Robotnik is a far more intimidating and cunning villain in this series as well, trying anything he can to destroy the last rebels against his immortal regime. Even as his own nephew, Snively, isn't off limits from his rage. In fact, he's often his punching bag. Then of course, there's this whole bucket of lore that is exclusive to the show and would later be borrowed and elaborated upon by the Archie comic books to a lesser extent about the planet of Mobius, its history, and even introduction of a force that could possibly be more powerful than Robotnik. The show, however, as great as it is, ends unfortunately on a major cliffhanger. A cliffhanger that promises a change to the status quo, a new story arc where Snively would take over in Robotnik's stead alongside his new accomplice who for years was a mystery to everyone as to who it could be, uh, but it was apparently the Ixus Nargus, the uh, more powerful force than Robotnik I alluded to a moment ago. This was something which for Western animation of the time was quite bold, or at least it would have been if it wasn't ultimately robbed of it. You see, the show was cancelled after two seasons, never to be finished. Nevertheless, the show was well-liked and discussed online by other Sonic fans and enjoyers of cartoons alike, with the fans of the show eventually coming up with their own identifier for the show, uh, Sat AM that is. Sonic Sat AM, since the show came on Saturday mornings. This name came about mainly due to the fact that they wanted a name to distinguish the show from other Sonic-related media. Fans of the time would come to create message boards for the show specifically, creating fan fictions and theorizing what season 3 would have held in store had the show continued. As well as getting rather pissed that the show had become rather difficult to track down or watch as more time separated from the show's initial airing to then. Skip ahead several years to around 2000 at the advent of a new website, FUS, or Fans United for Sadium.com. This website would serve the purpose of both being a fan activist website trying to contact Deke Entertainment, the creators of both the aforementioned shows, in an attempt to try to get the series fully released on DVD, as well as to be a hub for all fans of the show to come and discuss the show in the forums, share their fanfics, fan art, etc. On a personal note, I remember visiting this website often as a kid around 2006 to 2007, as I was really into the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise at that point, and was looking up any place that had info on any random Sonic-related lore or media that I might not have found until then. 
Sadayam in particular was of interest to me due to its style and darker stories, which, as I was growing up a little older at the time, was appealing to me more and more. I remember looking at the screenshots and plot descriptions of the episodes there on this website, long before I was able to actually watch the show in full when it was finally released on DVD by chance that same year in 2007, the site fulfilling its primary goal. I still have it too, and what's actually kind of cool about this is you can see all of the case covers and the inside of it, as well as the DVD disc art as well, is all fan art. Something which the company at the time who was making the DVD actually reached out to the Sadiem community for, which really shows just how much the fan dedication and pleading at some point really attributed to this thing actually being released. And looky there, here's some fan art from Spax3, a fellow I talked about in a video for two hours at one point. That's pretty cool. Oh, and look at this. This is like peak mid to early 2000s, like darkest. Ah, it's, it's bringing back memories. Well, anyway, I guess you could say I was pretty lucky to have found out about the show just around the time it was easy to watch it again. Rather than those back in 1993 who had to find other means of watching the show if they ever wanted to see it again. Mind you, all of this information is to simply set the background for where the protagonist of our story comes in. It's from this website's community around 2002 where Richard Kuda would first make a name for himself and make a name. He certainly did. Richard Anthony Kuda, born April 13th of 1981, like many of his age of the time, grew up watching cartoons and playing video games. Sonic the Hedgehog, of course, being one of them. What first got you into Sonic the Hedgehog slash Sonic Satam? Like, where did you first see it and what made you stick around with it? Well, Satam was definitely the catalyst to my devotion towards the Sonic franchise. Because honestly, that show is the only reason I ever expressed interest. Beforehand, I was a Nintendo loyalist, as you could say, who would ridicule anyone who'd claim that Sega was more superior. I don't know, maybe it was my early years of gatekeeping, since a lot of kids at the time were very defensive on which game console they preferred, especially if you were that elite Neo Geo Turbo Graphics fan. <laughs> but, um,. Now, I do kind of remember being at Toys R Us in the summer of 1991 when I was pre-ordering the Super Nintendo with my mom since it was being released that August or September at that time. And right before school started, I believe, because everybody was talking about it and I remember so many of my friends said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get it this weekend, eh, whatever. So it was a weird competition. But so anyway... Um, as I was browsing around, looking at the various NES titles to kill time, there was a Genesis console on demo that was showcasing the original Sonic the Hedgehog. So curiosity got the best of me and I ended up enjoying it. I, I mean, for a fast paced game with incredible graphics, catchy music, and a character that reflects how a preteen felt in the early 90s, it, it really was a character that pushed boundaries of what, say, Mario was doing at the time. But what's strange about this one-time encounter was that I never really thought about the game until Sonic 2 came out. Now again, I didn't care for Sega, so I didn't even own a Sega console. So the only way I could play these games was at a friend's or cousin's house. Sonic 2, however, it started to grab my attention a bit more towards these games since um, the introduction of Tails, because he was such a unique and adorable character to where it convinced me not to limit myself to just one video game company, since there was so much creativity in what I was seeing with just this Sonic character and all. <laughs> so a year passes by, so it's around fall 1993. There's two Sonic cartoons that debuted simultaneously, as we all know. There was the silly and goofy Adventures of Sonic and then the dark and gritty Sat-A-M. Um, Adventures was like good for a laugh and it definitely had its moments. 
but I mostly gravita gravitated towards Sat AM due to my affinity for sci-fi fantasy novels, but also for franchises like Star Trek and Star Wars. And these grandiose adventures involving engaging characters, compelling stories, world building in such a surrealistic landscape, th that's exactly the type of show that really captivated my interest. So it really hit all the right notes and made me realize that this Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon has a lot of growing potential and sure enough I became an instant fan and most importantly I didn't care that these characters weren't in the games I just really enjoyed their personalities and what they contributed to this freedom fighter group of Sonics but at the time I, I had confidence that the popularity of the show at least according to my friends that I talked to in junior high at the time you know during lunch hour and such would eventually lead to like characters like Sally, Bunny, and such to be featured in a game. And while that technically did happen in a spin-off called Sonic Spinball, <laughs> um, I didn't really count that as a genuine inclusion since they're basically unplayable cameos in a bonus stage. But sad enough, that was the only time they were ever featured in a Sonic game, and I spent many years hoping and holding on to this delusional optimism that they would eventually get acknowledged in some type of media. And to this day, I'm still waiting for that to happen in pretty much anything. <laughs> but while Sega neglected to incorporate the Freedom Fighters and the games, I did find solace by reading the Archie comics since I consider it a glorified continuation of Sat AM, especially when the series was cancelled, which still haunts me to this day and a lot of fans. Though the cancellation of Archie kind of competes for that space since that also ended on a cliffhanger. <laughs> but who knows what the future holds at this point? I, I mean, like, nostalgia is popular now, so just gotta wait and see what surprises await us. And, but the, the fact that there's fan projects out there that's trying to produce, like, a third season of Sat AM, for example, I guess anything could be possible. So it's just about being patient. <laughs> Kuda, going under the screen name Saw Manic at around 2002 or so, had begun making a name for himself online through his efforts in contacting Deke Entertainment to air episodes of Sonic Sat AM again, as well as bootlegging low-quality Sonic Sat AM episodes on eBay for fellow fans of the show and new Sonic fans alike to experience the show. If you're at all familiar with the anime scene during this time, and really back through the 90s and 80s, bootlegging shows was pretty much common practice for those who uh, couldn't afford, say for example, getting every single episode of Neon Genesis Evangelion on a VHS officially uh, for the super cool price of $300 125 bucks or a 535 bucks adjusted for inflation. Collecting series in any sort of format at the time, however, was often a difficult task, as VHS tapes usually only had about a two or three episodes of a series, and there was no guarantee that a series would even be completely put on VHS. Even when DVD came around, some series took decades to get any official release, with the likes of SWAT Cats and Gargoyles coming to mind. All this to say is that Kudu was essentially selling a series that there was no alternative way of officially legally owning at the time in 2002. Richard has, on many occasions, talked about how important this show is to him, how it inspired him as a creator, as an artist, how it's helped shape him into the man he is today. So it becomes clear why he was so active in trying to have this show easily available to watch. When were you first made aware of the FUS or Fans United for Satan and online Satan fandom? Uh, and would you say that you were there from the start of it? Very much so. In fact, going back further, the first wave of Sonic communities were established on AOL news groups or, you know, um, primitive internet message boards, if you remember that far. <laughs> but at the time, people were very welcoming and respective. So, yes, believe it or not, guys, the Sonic fan base used to have composure and integrity. Yeah. <laughs> 
But anyway, I, I used to log on there like nearly every day after school and just chat about Sat AM and the Archie comics. And of course, back then, the name Sat AM wasn't even conceived yet. So everyone just referred to the show as The Dark One, in contrast to the Adventure series. And Sat AM would later get its name as a method to distinguish the two shows, since Sat AM means Saturday morning. And this could undoubtedly be applied to any Saturday morning cartoon, but since Sonic had two cartoons airing simultaneously, the name just kind of stuck. So in a way, I feel very fortunate to witness Sonic history, because a lot of people don't know the origins of the Sat AM title. Well, now you know. <laughs> And um, some junior high kids, like on AOL news groups at the time, came up with this idea, and I'm just really surprised that it stuck around. So believe it or not, a bunch of 12-year-olds came up with Sat AM. <laughs> and um, I, I guess around 1996 is when I joined Sonic HQ, which was one of the very first Sonic fan sites. And for what it was, it provided so much content to where it became my daily source for anything Sonic Media related. But then around the year 2000, like the actual year 2000, I discovered a site called Fuse, Fans United for Sat AM. It was being advertised on Sonic Web Rings, if you remember what those were. <laughs> hey, remember guest books? <laughs> but anyway, I'm kind of sidetracking. But yeah, Fuse was touted as the very first Sonic site that centered on Sat AM. So of course, me being an obsessive fan, joined immediately and started connecting with others who shared my passion for that series. But then in later years, there was conflict between me and some of the members, which led to some animosity resulting in me getting banned. <laughs> But uh, in hindsight, I do understand their reasoning, because to be blunt, I did some stupid shit I regret. <laughs> Nevertheless, the fan base over at FUS found his constant pestering of Deke and selling of the bootlegs to be counterproductive in getting the show back, or at least available for legitimate purchase, something which he took great issue with. Kuda thought the community was disrespecting him and being unappreciative of his contributions towards the spread of the show online and the campaign for its revival. On the other hand, the community of FUS thought he was being far too radical in his approach and that selling the bootlegs was sending the wrong message. After much deliberation and arguments, things would eventually come to a head when Kuda and his Sonmac account were banned from the website's forums, something which pissed him off all the more, as he would then then begin creating several alt accounts, pretending to be someone else, getting caught eventually by either defending himself or getting into an argument about why he was banned before, and then one by one those accounts would be banned again and again. Most of this time frame is unfortunately hearsay, and screenshots of these early events of Kuda's tale are seemingly lost to time by now but a few remnants of those days remain, one of which being Kuda's cease and desist letter from Deke Entertainment over him selling illegal copies of the show on eBay for profit, having been caught twice doing so by this point, as well as an archive of all the alt accounts Kuda created only to have banned from the website, having his own special banned user group entitled Son Manic is a Loser, as the ritual of Kuda creating an ult, jumping into the forums and asking why he was banned was such a frequent exercise by the mods that it eventually became his own special banned user group as a monument to all the times Rich had done this. It's for this reason that almost everyone who used the website and the forum especially were all too aware of who Kuda was and what he was up to. Why did you keep making so many accounts for FUS back in the day when they just kept banning you. What about being there made you want to keep coming there and making accounts in spite of this? Uh, short answer, I was relentless. <laughs> since, since there was no other Sonic site like it, and, and being exiled from a fandom based on a show that I held very dear to me just seemed wrong. I, I figured somehow I could redeem myself by using other aliases and then build my reputation until the final reveal, so to speak. But 
Yeah, the mods were very astute and immediately knew it was me, so I just gave up after like seven tries. <laughs> but to be fair, I was banned from the forums, so I still had access to the general site, so it wasn't a total loss. <laughs> However, fast forward a few years later and Rich would eventually be welcomed back to full access on the website's forums due to Rich having contacted the uh, then owner of FUS, Quiznos, at the time being known as Sonic. Sonic would post a question to the community, seeing if they would be alright letting Sonmanic back in, asking, quote, Okay, first of all, although I'm posting this to everyone, I only want to hear from people who were here when Sawmanic started doing shit. I don't want to hear, well, I wasn't there when it happened, but I say yes or no, or anything like that. Um, yeah, I'm kind of indifferent at this point. I just know last time I brought someone back without asking anyone, it caused chaos for like 10 minutes. I don't know if this should really go into conversational issues, but I'm curious about your opinions." Unquote. The following was the response from the community. No! 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 Yes! Yes! No! Oh, that boy ain't right. There was a mostly overall consensus that no was the response. However, some did think he should come back, but not for any charitable reasons. User and FUS project staff Jim Doe was also quick to inform everyone why exactly Saw Manic was banned in the first place, and continues to be banned to this day on a day-by-day -day basis at times. Quote, for the uninitiated and to remind some of the veterans of just why he's no longer welcome here, Saw Manic did the following in no particular order. Advertised and traded copies of Sat AM over the message boards, violating board rules. Either sold or planned to sell, I don't personally remember if he actually went through with it, copies of Sat AM for monetary gain, which is an extreme violation of copyright laws and therefore quite illegal. Every time anyone brought up the fact that anything he was trying to do was in any way illegal or infeasible, which most of the things he tried to do were, he would become whiny, petulant, bitchy, defensive, and generally a stupid, idiotic flamer jerk. I don't know what exact action of his was the final straw, but it was pretty much the entire package of stupidity that got him banned. He banned jumped, he banned jumped again, he banned jumped again, and he banned jumped again. He banned jumped under the guise of Joe Robot, but this time, Neek decided to give him half another chance. Eventually, he revealed himself as Sawmanic and said something along the lines of, Ha! You never knew it was me because I changed my ways and I am now a nice guy. In which, he was completely mistaken because nobody had been, in fact, fooled because he hadn't really changed at all. So he got banned again. He banned jumped again. He banned jumped again. I'm sure you see a pattern already. This is why, by the by, we actually have a Saw Manic is a loser group, especially set for his banned jumping accounts. During some of this time, he also hung around the FUS IRC chat room. I've never been there myself, but I've heard from several reliable sources that he was just as much of an idiot there as he was here on the forums. The only reason they let him keep coming in, I've gathered, was to make him feel unwelcome directly to his face so that maybe he'd get a clue. He did not. Finally, he showed his face here again, when he's still not welcome, and from all indications, has not in fact changed his ways, despite his protestations to the contrary. He's a paranoid jerk who thinks that the entire world was designed purely to profit him, and it confuses him when other people don't get in line with his delusion. He truly thinks that deep, deep down, everyone likes him and that we will forgive him at some point, regardless of the fact he still and will likely ever be a complete, amoral asshole." Unquote. After months of this thread going on and on, Quiznos would eventually give her statement on the situation, passing the responsibility on to the admins of the site staff to allow or disallow him back on the forums. Ultimately, Saw Manic was allowed back onto the website for the time being, and with his return would come the bearing of a new fruit for the Satyam community, something that, according to Kuda, he had been working towards for the last few years. Bye -bye. 
As soon as Son Manic was fully allowed back into FUS, he began announcing that he had somehow gotten in contact with Sega and had been interviewed by several animation studios all working towards a Sonic Satyam revival in the form of a feature-length film that Rich had been working on for some time now. Richard had apparently been trying to pitch this movie idea for some time, calling up Sega, contacting them through email until someone at Sega, according to Rich, had finally contacted him about the movie pitch with the following statement. Quote, I just returned from Japan and we did discuss the Sonic movie, either for theatrical release or straight to DVD. Sega Japan is considering several options on how to develop a Sonic movie or a new TV show, and it's a decision that will not be made quickly. They do feel that a new project should be developed in the West, as Sonic is considered a Western property. It's never been that popular in Japan. However, they have placed your idea in the pre-greenlit stage until you can submit the details regarding your place in this project. In order for them to seriously consider a proposal for Sonic, they will need information on you and your group, what experience or background you have, what approach you would take, 2D versus 3D, storyline, etc. Financials on the production, what financing you have, who would be the production, production timeline, possible voice talent, and any details to give them a complete picture of your group and your expertise. I realize that's a lot to put together, but they tend to ask for a lot of information and take a long time making a decision. Good luck, regards, unquote. Upon hearing this news, Rich went out of his way to announce it all around the forums and anywhere he could, something which greatly irritated many, including Quiznos, who had just previously vouched for him to get back on the website, writing an extremely long rant about, well, everything Kuda had been saying, like the fact that Sonic Stadium had actually posted news about this movie development that Richard Kuda had actually gotten kind of far into it. Noting how Sonic Stadium had recently posted uh, the movie news as, well, news. And so she decided to share her side of the story and what she knew about the email that Richard had gotten and gave her perspective on it. Note that for some reason in this screenshot, Kuda's name is censored and then it's not censored in other areas so i i have no idea why that's the case but going forward quote now let me explain what a pre-green light is it's nothing absolutely nothing there's no such thing as a pre-green light kuda took this as oh my god we want to make your movie lol and bragged to a bunch of sonic places online it wasn't until someone basically told him that he had nothing at all and showed him why that kuda backed down and shut up for a bit taking back everything he said a green light is very unlikely now the sonic franchise is failing look at the numbers how much does it cost for a CGI film to be made. At least 45 million. Sega does not have that kind of funding at all. Neither does Solika whatever films, and neither does Richard Kuda. Not only that, but Kuda has confirmed that the movie is not a Sadiem movie, but rather a movie that uses all elements from the games, comics, and shows. So it's not a Sadiem movie. Kuda is simply trying to be crowned before the race is over, and I'm getting tired of it. Everywhere I go, he's getting people's hopes up with his bullshit. His goddamn bullshit that I can prove, and I'm sick of having to deal with it. He's told me many times that I should not post any information until he has a contract with Sega, a signed contract. But instead, he's getting people's hopes high up and even his own. It's annoying. I'm tired of having to tell him not to post his bullshit until it's confirmed, but he just has to try and be something. He has to try and be some kind of hero that he's not. Cold? Yes, but I'm sick of putting up with it. Unquote. Rich, however, didn't heed her advice and continued on with his talking until he was eventually contacted by Sega themselves once again. Quote, I was contacted by our European office as they recently came across, link, 
on your own website yet another link. I just want to make it clear that Sega has not relinquished legal consent to you in any way to pursue the production of a Sonic movie, and it's not appropriate for you to suggest that Sega has done so. We have merely spoken about your interest in securing financing and producing a Sonic movie. You cannot represent yourself as the SEGA sanctioned producer of a Sonic movie. I want you to correct this situation immediately on both the animation forum and on your website and in any other forum where you have posted. This is not acceptable. As you have yet to even submit a proposal, we are far away from any production of a Sonic movie." Unquote. Well, this time Richard would actually heed the advice, and a time of silence came from Son Manic until close to Christmas Eve 2007, when Rich would announce the terrible news regarding his future Sonic film. Quote, I know I've been secret about this for a while, and even received backlash last year for it, but considering the recent events, I don't see the harm in coming clean. Sega of Japan finally made their response, but the situation is bittersweet. To avoid actually posting the entire email, I'll post an excerpt. I regret to inform you that we are already in talks with a third party for a production of the Sonic feature. We often receive an interesting offer for the Sonic movies, whether directly or through Sega of America. Well, there you have it. Sega of Japan are in talks with the third party company regarding a feature film, but unfortunately it will not involve me. However, I'd love to share the ideas I had for this movie and post the outlines, artwork, and script. If that's the case, I'll demote the script to fanfiction and have it freely distributed to Sonic fans. I've already begun the process and all the aforementioned film materials can be viewed here. This year, I can vouch that the film was pitched to Fox, DreamWorks, Sony, Deke, and Universal, who all expressed in high interest in the film, uh, but ultimately, some other company has beaten me to the punch. The official script for the Sonic movie is now posted for the public eye as well, since it's now demoted to fanfiction. It's converted to PDF format, so you'll have to download Acrobat Reader Review. Considering that it is a first draft, spelling and grammatical errors are expected. I didn't correct them since it would alter history and the footprint I left in Hollywood. So with great pleasure, I present to you the first installment of the Sonic trilogy that Sega rejected. Sonic the Hedgehog, Secret of the Chaos Emeralds. So once again, the phrase third party rears its ugly head, and it does raise some more questions. Does this mean a third party company associated with Sega? Are they referring to 4Kids Entertainment, since they were recently involved with Sonic X? Will it be a live action, CGI, or 2D? I honestly have no clue, but the fact that a Sonic movie is going to be made. I did remember that Deke was trying to contact them a couple months back, so I went ahead and left them a message. And this was their reply. It's not us. We'll try and find out who it is. Knowing that Japan has made their intentions clear, it leaves us Sonic fans pondering. Should we jump for joy or recoil in fear? Anyway, when I tried to inquire about the third party company, Sega responded. Dear Mr. Kuda, thank you for your mall. As we are bound by the confidentiality clause in the agreement, we cannot reveal the name of our partner at this point. At this point, all we can say is good luck to you and your future projects. We do not think we can discuss your movie project any further. In other words, game over for me, and the arduous journey that I've traveled in the last two years. So I guess, be happy that the Sonic movie is happening. I don't know. I'm really depressed." Unquote. If you haven't caught on to all of this yet, Son Manic claims that he, a nobody, a random Sonic fan with no background in film, no real portfolio to speak of, or any real reason for Sega to pay attention to his pitch whatsoever, claims that Sega not only did respond to his inquiries about making a Sonic film, not only did they take interest in the film project and his ideas as a whole, but he also got far enough to have been able to pitch the idea to several animation studios with someone at Sega helping him along the way, only to finally be tail-ended due to Sega of Japan having a no interest in his film project. Not because they didn't like it or thought it this was just all ridiculous, but because they decided to go with someone else instead. If all this seems rather far-fetched, trust me, you wouldn't be the only one to think so. However, there is actual evidence that this may all be true, or at least partly. 
Why did you want to make a Sonic <clears throat> Satam film? So back in 1998, the main writer of the show, Ben Hurst, announced his plans to revive Satam for season three, but his backup idea was to pursue a feature film for either theatrical release or direct to video. And it completely blindsided the Sonic community since this news was just out of left field. So you can imagine how excited Satam fans were at that time. I, for one, was just so, so excited that I managed to track his email and personally wish him luck and hope to someday work on a Sonic project like that. And a couple days later, I got this really kind response from him basically telling me to stay dedicated to my goals, never let setbacks get you down and fight for your ideas. And that advice has always resonated with me and he became an inspiration for anything creative I was involved in. Now, flash forward to 2002, where fans got a devastating follow-up where the film was canceled, and of course this was later revealed due to the unprofessional nature of Ken Penders, who apparently collaborated with Ben Hurst, who basically sabotaged any effort with Satyam in general. Just any, any type of like semblance of that medium ever coming back and it's so depressing but there's just so many video essays about that debacle so i won't go into any gritty details regarding that since ken penders is like a whole other topic so yeah we'll just leave it at that but um when i was a senior in college the sonic franchise was in its downslope this was during the Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic 06 era where the game started to take a turn for the worst as well as the fan base. Um, it was also when the Archie comics released that controversial issue of when Sally slapped Sonic, which, acknowledged, which ignited the, the Sally hate in shipping wars between her and Amy Rose and all that crap. And this dip in quality or this dark period made me reflect on Sonic's heyday when, again, fans used, to re fans used to respect one another and could have their differences without this malicious behavior. And even though I was a graphic designer pursuing my career in digital design and multimedia, a part of me wanted me to branch out and flex my writing skills. And I felt that writing a summary for a potential Sonic movie would be the best way to start. Because they say when you start writing, use subjects that you're passionate about. Like, a couple months prior to graduation, I finished this trilogy outline that chronicled Sonic's origin story involving the Satyam lore. Because while Archie did provide a backstory, I wanted to focus strictly on Satyam because the comics trailed off into its own thing like a couple years after the show was even cancelled. Now, when I graduated, I had this newfound motivation in life as a graphic designer and aspiring writer. So now that I had a completed synopsis for a potential Sonic movie trilogy, I knew I had to contact Ben Hurst just to inform him of my endeavors and just to catch him up since I was, I was only in high school when I sent him that fanboy email years back. So <laughs> it was so endearing that he not only remembered me, but our email conversations evolved into phone conversations. And, um, I felt horrible about this failed attempt in, in getting a Satyam movie off the ground, especially due to the ineptitude of how Penders handled it. So I told him of my plans and hoped that we could somehow collaborate and give his dream project another shot. And while he appreciated the gesture, he politely declined and said the whole experience burned him out and he didn't want to deal with Sega anymore. And that's understandable. And. I guess this is where the passing of the torch comes into play since he gave me his blessing in trying to accomplish what he couldn't. Now mind you, I was 24 with no studio or Hollywood experience aside from the freelance projects I was involved in for various companies and gaming and music. So this whole pursuit was incredibly ambitious, but it was just something I wanted to do and since I was young at the time, I wanted to do something that was a, a little bit more out of my league, so I wouldn't have something I would regret, like in later years or anything. 
plus, you know, what better way to begin post-college life than to launch into developing an animated film based on your childhood icon, right? <laughs> Were you really able to pitch this film idea slash script of yours to DreamWorks, Fox Animated Studios, Deke, etc.? Um, as a matter of fact, yes, but Universal too, since they were the ones who jumped on board. But yeah, it was done through the appropriate steps once Sega of America gave their approval to seek out studio interest. But let's rewind just a bit since my initial contact with Sega was surprisingly smooth. The licensing department arranged a meeting with me and I met with um, Robert Leffler and at the uh, defunct San Francisco branch. It was a two-hour presentation where I discussed the current status of Sonic's popularity, basically. How Satyam fans are clamoring for a revival, how incorporating the Freedom Fighters and the Satyam lore could take the franchise in a better direction, and so forth. And about a month later, I get a call from Robert stating that they wanted to present my idea to their Japanese branch, and they'd circle back once they would got any type of info. And to my chagrin, I get an email from Robert stating that Sega of Japan is interested and they provided this huge laundry list of stipulations in order for them to officially greenlight it. So basically, they wanted to know what the film would be animated, what actors would be involved, that typical stuff. So with Sega's blessing, I set forth on this audacious quest and began my journey. And there's documented evidence that chronicles this. So there are receipts that I made available for everyone online if they want to seek it out. How? For someone with no real background or portfolio in film. Uh, I'm glad you asked that. So after the positive reception from Sega, I called up Ben and told him I was successful in getting Sega's approval to move forward. And Ben was well aware of my lack of feature film experience or even any type of reputable production background. But considering that I somehow managed to exceed his efforts, he instructed me on the steps I needed to take to even get acknowledged from like a Hollywood studio. And this involved putting together a pitch package. So like designing character models, writing the movie treatment, and most importantly, hiring an agent. <laughs> so throughout 2006 through early 2007, I started recruiting other people to assist me with the character art and such while I was designing the presentations and posters using my graphic design skills. But on top of that, I was constantly scouting around for an agent to represent me in this project. And I was fortunate enough to um, answer the call from someone who was emphatically interested since they actually believed in my Sonic project and they felt that a movie was long overdue. And by the summer of 2007, I was finally prepared with all the necessary materials needed with my reputation to get me in the studio door. So I definitely did my homework. Why do you think Sega of America and others took a real interest in your film idea in particular? Were you just a really good salesman or a right place at the right time, etc.? I can be persuasive in a, when a situation calls for it, but I like to assume it was a combination of many things aligning at the perfect time, since um, it was pitched during Sega's experimental phase when they were receiving backlash for lack of quality control and their questionable business practices, while the fan base was basically turning against each other over this division between classic versus modern. And I feel coming from someone expressing genuine concern for their mascot, it probably struck a chord with them, especially when you're doing a face-to-face -face interaction with Sega associates and they're, they're witnessing this zealous energy from an older Sonic fan who happens to have the knowledge and, and foresight on how to improve their franchise. But then again, it all could have just been luck. So who knows what really happened? I'm just glad that it did. <laughs> 
A fair amount of the community of FUS didn't think that this was at all real, and that Rich was doing all of this for attention. However, Rich was not without his supporters by now, as many had attached hope for their beloved show coming back through Rich's movie, and hearing about his plight seemed just believable enough to them. Then depending on what you choose to believe, either Kuda was an absolutely crazy son of a bitch, and actually pestered enough people at Sega that he had managed to get through to someone one in 2006. Sega of America arranges a meeting, he proceeded to have all this concept art commissioned, drafts upon drafts of scripts written, storyboards made, presentations and concept pitches made, all of which are actual things that you can read if nothing else are very real. Sega of America approves this idea, relays his concepts to Sega of Japan, and Sega of Japan expresses interest in 2007 uh, by stipulation that they must meet certain certain requirements before they officially approve anything, i.e. wanting a big budget studio to with reputable actors for the film. He then hired an agent, invested an entire summer traveling to six different studios for pitch presentations. Universal Pictures, in conjunction with Deke Entertainment, jumps on board that fall. Universal arranges a collaborative meeting with Deke, Sega of America, and Sega of Japan on conference call. Sega of Japan then rejects the idea, since they claim that they are working on their own film, Universal Pictures and Sega of America try to negotiate, but to no avail. In this version of the story, Kuda put all of his life into this project for about a year or so, had managed to get at least some interest at Sega going before then, admittingly, realistically, was given the cold shoulder by Sega of Japan um, when they said that they had their own movie going. Now, the other version of the story would be that Richard Kuda never got that far with Sega of America, and instead lied about all of this, commissioned artists, and created all this stuff for a non-existent project, faked business cards, and took pictures of himself outside of major animation studios, all as part of a great lie to use the fan base's desperation for any sort of news about their forgotten show against them, effectively manipulating some to his side in what could only be called a sonic fan base power move. Kuda has showcased a lot of evidence that these meetings happened, or he created a very convincing story with a ton of fake evidence to back up his lie. So where does the truth lie? Well, something interesting about Kuda's claims is that he notes that Sega in 2007 were already working on their own Sonic movie, which is interesting because something like that was indeed going on at Sega at the time, but it may not include the whole story. You see, Satayam had a few writers on board. The man behind all the most famous plot important episodes of the series, however, is American writer Ben Hurst. Following the cancellation of the Sonic Satayam movie, Ben Hurst became active in the Sonic fandom, posting on websites such as Saturday Morning Sonic and FUS revealing information about his plans for the unproduced third season of the show, what it would have entailed what big plot points would have happened, giving fans at least a taste of the season that could have been. Quote, It tugs at my heart every time I hear people lamenting the lack of a third season of Sonic. Because like many of you, I became deeply involved in the lives and the adventures of the Sonic characters. It is my dreams to bring the story lines which were left unfinished in the second season to their final conclusion. And I'm working now to bring that to pass. Though it is an uphill road, and I'm afraid my chances of success are slim. Nonetheless, I'm going to give it my best shot. Believe me, I want to see this as much as all those here who share the love of Sadie M. Sonic. I'm happy to see so many sharing a passion for a simple blue hedgehog. Here's some interesting stuff, such as a Sonic movie. I am thinking more along the lines of a feature film or a direct-to-video movie featuring Sonic characters from the cartoon and completing the storylines developed in the second season. There are are no third season scripts. The only thing in existence is the sketch that I did for the third season. There are many twists and turns that I shouldn't disclose, just in case my efforts towards continuing these characters and storylines is successful. But if I can't get anything moving on this project, I will reveal them or possibly write them into a profic, as it was called by someone." Unquote. That message was actually from 1998 
back when Ben Hurst, and I suppose anyone who was a fan or contributed to Sonic's at AM, still had hopes that this show was ever going to get finished. Now, that part about the movie in particular is pretty interesting, as it is a rather sad story. As quoted from the Sonic News Network wiki page on the topic, Quote, the late Ben Hurst, one of the writers of the Sonic the Hedgehog television series, attempted to pitch a continuation of the show in 2002, either in the form of a third season or a movie. At this point in time, MGM had given the film rights for Sonic the Hedgehog back to Sega after Sonic the Hedgehog Wonders of the World was cancelled, which uh, by the way is a completely different cancelled Sonic film where he would jump out of the TV and meet up with a boy and go on adventures with him. Hurst consulted with Deke entertainment about his plans, and Deke gave Hearst the name of a Sega executive who wanted to talk with him more about his idea. Hearst then got a call from Ken Penders, then head writer of Archie Comics' Sonic the Hedgehog comic series, who had been alerted about his interest in making a Sonic movie. Though Hearst offered Penders to include him in the effort and told him about his strategy, which involved developing a satisfying storyline to conclude the show while simultaneously giving Sega ideas for new games, Penders scrapped his attempt by claiming to Sega later on that Hearst was trying to co-opt the franchise, which led Sega to dismiss Hearst from the project. Penders would then pitch his own concept for a movie on September of 2003, unquote. Quite the slimy little weasel, huh? This effectively made sure that beloved writer Ben Hurst, the life force in many people's eyes for Sadie M, would never have a chance at finishing his story. While Ken Penders, the man infamous for having all the Sonic characters in his comic have sex lives and making the comic uh, much more akin to a soap opera about relationship issues, and yes, this was officially endorsed by Sega, and generally one of the most hated Sonic related figures had just gotten his his chance to tell his own story, entitled Sonic Armageddon, of which has four pieces of concept art in this pitch trailer, which I'll show in full here. They said it was just a video game, but I knew better. After all, my dad's job was to search for life on other planets. Although many versions of the events he witnessed made their way out into the media, that was just security doing its job. Like who could keep a secret that big, right? Anyway, this is what my dad said really happened. Yeah. Well, as you might have guessed, this film never came to be. The idea had apparently officially been dropped 
in 2007 due to a quote-unquote massive corporate upheaval, according to Ken Penders himself. Now, what other Sonic-related movie was also claimed to have been cancelled in 2007? Kuda's film. Now, all of this could be a pretty big coincidence, or Ken could be lying about the film even having lasted that long in development, or I guess in the idea pool. For all we know, it could have ended up being thrown out all the way back in 2003, nearly as soon as it was pitched, which given the art and concept trailer, Trailer, I wouldn't be super surprised about that. Either way, it could be more evidence towards Sega stepping away from the Sadiem slash a darker stories related to Sonic. It is important to note that Sonic X had already come out by this point and to great success, particularly in the West. So Sega of Japan might have also lost interest in both Ken Penders and Kuda's ideas for that reason alone. But who really knows? Sega was obviously looking for some way for a Sonic movie to happen for a long time. Maybe they were open to hearing every idea available at the moment. I mean, after all, if Kuda's story is taken at face value, uh, basically he got a rare chance to talk with the bigwigs about the movie, and they slammed the door in his face. But needless to say, after Kuda's long message to the community about his failed film project, many actually did feel bad for him, and at the very least were eager to read his script and see all the concept art that he had commissioned by popular artists in the fandom for this film. However, as these concepts were released, more controversy would spring up. Artist Sionex came forward and claimed that the design for one of Sawmat's character sheets, namely Robotnik's, looked eerily similar to his design of the character that he was using for his own Sat AM project posting a side-by-side -side comparison here. Most might assume that Rich would simply cite Sionex's design as inspiration for his own and, well, leave it at that. But instead, he fervently denied having any prior knowledge to Sionex's design idea, seemingly taking it as an attack on his character despite Sionex's polite tone. Many were quick to point out that on the forum post where Sionex had posted his art before, Sawmanic could be found lurking and commenting on the post. When faced with this undeniable evidence, Rich pointed the blame to sheet artist Rog Faraz. However, Rog was not about to take the fall for Rich, and fully admitted that Rich had indeed given him Sionex's Robotnik design for reference for his own redesign of Robotnik for the film. Having his own team lay his lies bare before the fan base, site admin thanked Rog for calling out Rich and being honest, something that Rich didn't take too well. Quote, I think it's best I just renounce my fandom for Sonic and just move on. Defending myself is obviously not going to mend for all the minor details that get misunderstood, or in this case, details blanked from the memory due to being swamped with work. But yeah, I'm tired of causing turmoil even though I have good intentions. This project was supposed to unite the fan base, and knowing that it will never see the light of day, I consider it my swan song, and we'll move forward with something else. <laughs> I smell bullshit. The fandom didn't need reuniting, not from the likes of you anyway. Just do us all a favor and get the hell out of here. Quit making up excuses since it's been proven by others that you're a liar with serious problems. Whatever, this is the last thing I need on Christmas. I won't be posting here anymore." Unquote. After all the ranting and arguing in the thread for, well, days, on the same day Rich would post that message on the 26th, admin Sonicus Prime, who had been one of the ones calling out Rich over his claims, and Rocky Raccoon did what they felt was best for the community, and banned Richard Kuda once again. Prime saying, quote, Okay. Time to get this sorted. Saw Manic, aka a knothole resident, aka Rich Kuda, aka whatever the hell you want to be called these days, you are banned for like the 13th time. And this time, maybe you could like do us a favor and keep it that way. No ban jumping like you did before, please. Okay? Thanks. Plus, this topic is now closed. Unquote. Many rejoiced in Kuda, or a Nahal resident at this point in time, once again being exiled, with some of his supporters trying to fight tooth and nail to get him back, leading to Rocky Raccoon making a public post on the site homepage announcing Son Manic's ban for plagiarism, which only infuriated Rich more. Rocky and Sonicus Prime would then ban anyone who fought the ban or for Kuda in general, and any of Kuda's alts 
of course, as well. Rich expressed his frustration with the FUS website and the general Sonic fanbase over on the less popular but still very relevant Sonic Saturday website called Saturday Morning Sonic, owned by Poor Poise Muffins, someone who had taken Rich's side back over at FUS and was happy to have Rich take refuge over on his site. Rich would make several posts about Prime, Rocky Raccoon, and the website's community at large, calling them malicious, stubborn, close-minded fascists that can go rot in the ninth realm of hell for all he cares, and he was happy to have left the site for good. Something which Sonicus Prime, under the username Instrument of Destruction over at Saturday Morning Sonic forums, would be more than happy to argue with him on, as well as remind him that he didn't leave, he was kicked yet again. Quote, I would like to clearly point out that you didn't leave. You were kicked, yet again, for what seems like the sixth time. You were kicked out for taking a design of Robotnik from an FUS member, then commissioned an artist to copy that design with a few small changes, claimed you forgot, and tried pinning the blame on the artist you hired. Then when the artist revealed the truth, you pulled the oops, that memory of mine trick. And it wasn't merely a one-time incident, but more like a list of incidents that are longer than my arm. I'd like to list them here, but I'd only make you look more like a fool than you've done yourself. And from what I recall, FUS did its fair share of input for the actual DVD box set. FUS doesn't push its way on people. We kick out those who don't follow the rules, and you couldn't follow the rules even if you had a guide for dummies on you. Once again, you still wish to live in fantasy land and make stuff up as you go along. And for the long six to seven years I can remember, the only only tarred in that place was you. Richard would respond with the following. Believe what you will, but all I know is that FUS's perception of me is false and always has been. Unless they actually take the time to get to know me instead of profiling me, it's probably the attitude they'll continue to have. You guys will obviously never understand me, and I've come to terms with that. So the least thing FUS can do is acknowledge my effort in trying to unite the Sonic fandom. As for the Robotnik drawing, it honestly slipped my mind and I'm thankful that ROG refreshed it. It's beyond me why something so important would blank in my mind, but I'm not a dishonest person. It's lies that get misconstrued over time which has caused the hatred of me that exists today. And as I recently notice, am banned once again for expressing a deep devotion for something that I hold dear to me. What the fuck is FUS's problem? Anyway, there's no point in arguing since everyone there looks down upon me, and I will say this since you made your presence known. I at least got off my ass, spent my own money, and donated my time to fly to LA for pitch meetings. So don't you dare tell me I'm living a fantasy land. I have battle scars of my defeat and a whole assortment of evidence to back my story, verbal and physical. I posted pics, scanned studio passes, and even contacts. I really don't understand FUS's logic in refusing to believe me. Do you honestly think I have nothing better to do with my time than to orchestrate an intricate plan such as flying to LA and thanking my intentions by posing in front of studios that I visited? I've already explained myself several times and apparently none of it has gotten through their heads. After all the crap I've been through, I at least deserve gratitude for at least trying to unite the fan base, not a bad or a banning. FUS's policies will continue to baffle me as well as their integrity. Even though I stand here with wounds of my travels, you'd still deny my story. I just now found out that I was banned. Typical FUS. Unquote. This would lead to a heated back and forth between the two that would eventually come to a standstill, both sides seemingly getting nowhere at some point. Things seemed to settle down for just a while before a month later, when Rich would be interviewed by Purpoise Muffins in an attempt at damage control and clarification, which only pissed everyone off yet again. This would eventually lead to a few people on the website threatening Richard Kuda with what was at the time a very serious nuclear bomb to his life online. They threatened to create an Encyclopedia Dramatica article all about his drama and supposed lies that he has spread over his time online, as well as a few more embarrassing secrets of his that those of whom got close to him 
personally had learned of. This caused Rich to begin furiously ranting about how angry he is at not only the Sonic fanbase, but Sega as well, citing Japan as being too xenophobic to see the talents of the American Sonic creators, and how he was going to finally leave this fanbase for good, a purpoise muffins once again coming to Rich's defense. Quote, I repeat, 1. I officially left the Sonic community. I am no longer posting or contributing to any Sonic site. The only exception is here, but only for topics that I feel is necessary to post at. 2. I adhere to you and your friend Jones' request to never communicate through any medium, i.e. message board, online chat, or other. These are amendments that I am sticking by to prove how serious I am, so I hope you can do the same. Sonic is a chapter of my life that's over and I'm moving on just as this conversation should. Quote, it's not just with Sega, it's with all Japanese related businesses. I know because my dad used to work for a Japanese company for a couple years. In that time, he noticed that only the Japanese employees got promoted and he didn't. He used to complain about this and one day he even asked one of his fellow co-workers why he never got promoted. The answer, he wasn't Japanese. They follow a strict sense of cultural pride and their standards are very narrow. It may seem racist, but unfortunately it's the truth, and there's clear indications of this relating to Sega." Unquote. Sometime later, after this thread and the EV page eventually going up, Rich would attempt once more to contact Sega of Japan with his Sonic movie pitch, only to fail once more, once again citing Sega and Japan's supposed xenophobia for why they didn't accept his film proposal, ending his rant with a call to action to spam Sega's email and threatening to drop docs on the Sega employees involved with his rejection. This unbelievably childish response was met with failure yet again. Encyclopedia Dramatica, or ED, was first created on December 10th, 2004, and at the time, especially around 2006, the wiki would become infamous for documenting, let's just say, some interesting individuals online, as well as general pop culture, politics, religion, and topics of really all kinds including some extremely cursed shit. On the about page of ED's site, it says, quote, Done in the spirit of Ambrose Beer's The Devil's Dictionary, Encyclopedia Dramatica's purpose is to provide a central catalog for the e-public to view parody and satire of drama, memes, e-pals, and other interesting happenings on the internets. The goal is to provide comprehensive, reference-style parody to poke fun at everyone and everything on the internet, as well as an archive for online communities to document and reference deviant users." Unquote. Now these days, people usually go to Kiwi Farms for their gossip on the latest interesting internet individuals. But back in the day, ED was the place for this type of content, which of course brings us back to CUDA. With the advent of CUDA's ED page, quite a few things about his personal life, albeit parts he himself shared and uploaded online, were spread around for all the Sonic fanbase and soon even the general internet populace to see. In fact, I believe at one point his page was actually featured on the front page of the site, which given the context was, well, pretty bad for old Kuda. The first and without a doubt most infamous pieces of Rich's personal life would be his diaper space page. Quote, for the past few weeks, I've been reluctant about joining this community, not because I'm paranoid of my information leaking out to the public, but what type of characters I might encounter. So far, it seems to be a tame place and very welcoming. I love how the layout is similar to MySpace, only it caters to ABs and DLs. Anyway, I'm seeking any ABs that are within my proximity, especially females. Even though the AB community is mostly gay, I'm still open to accept online friendships as long as those people behave. I've had a few bad experiences in real life, and it's made me a bit hostile towards aggressive gay men. Anyway, I look forward to your responses, and hopefully we can meet up and have fun together." Unquote. Quote, nostalgia you can wear. As some of you babies know, Bambino diapers were the wondrous answer to the adult-style diapers that contained that 
baby style. Well, apparently, there's a new competing company that actually surpasses Bambino for one particular reason. They sell real adult pampers. Okay, they're not official pampers, but they are flawless replication of the plastic style pampers from 1995. Plastic, thick, and cute. So if you're one of those people that's been yearning for adult style baby diapers, check them out and really relive your childhood. No offense to Bambino, still a great product, but now I can truly experience that baby feel that I miss. Uh, for those of you who didn't catch it yet, diaperspace.com is a social media network for diaper lovers and the ABDL or Adult Baby Diaper Lover community. Adult baby diaper lovers are individuals, statistically usually male, who find enjoyment from wearing diapers. This enjoyment is usually sexual in nature, though many argue otherwise with the process of wearing diapers, setting up a nursery and acting like a baby, which can sometimes mean messing in their own diapers, as a calming escape from reality. Well, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole or play armchair psychologist about this strange behavior, it's important to understand that this turned out to be an important aspect of Rich's life, but one that came to much embarrassment to him during these days when he was first exposed, since he really wanted to be taken seriously. And, well, after people found out about this page, that just simply was not going to happen. So, I've got to ask, uh, why do you wear diapers, if you were to describe it in as quick and straightforward way as possible? <laughs> uh, well, it's just part of the ABDL culture. <laughs> you see, diapers represent the innocence of childhood and the security that we long for, since it's an article of clothing that's not only comforting, but it's also convenient. And aesthetically speaking, the designs on them are kind of cute since they're reminiscent of actual baby diapers. But I know there's a lot of confusion when it comes to ABDLs, but I'll clarify that to me, it's not a fetish. While it can be for some, most treat it as a lifestyle, which is what I do. So kind of think of it as role play that you commit to on a daily basis. So I guess that's the abridged version of it. <laughs> Several not safe for me to show on YouTube videos and pictures were shared of Kuda in a diaper among other things on the site and of course the ED page by extension. The ED page also gave screenshots to Richard's OK Cupid and MySpace pages, which revealed more of who the man behind all this Satyam forum infamy really was. Or at least a look into his personal life. Quote Valentine's Day a secular holiday fabricated by the greeting card industry that only contributes to my emotional affliction. How can someone maintain a positive spirit when couples are making out a few yards shy of you? Or how commercials are constantly endorsing jewelry and painting a delusional picture of what the happy relationship is supposed to act like? I, for one, am too familiar with this territory, especially since I've never been fortunate enough to experience true love. My perception of the opposite sex has significantly lowered considering the amount of times my emotions have been toyed with in recent years. The feeling of deception and exploitation is something that has unfortunately been involved with my life, and I intend to break this pattern. Friendship is all well and good, but I'm ready to settle down with a special someone, seeking more than just a buddy, someone who displays true compassion and affection without hesitation. I desire to be someone that's supportive, understanding, and looks for a man that's generous intelligent, considerate, and all-around fun person. It will be comforting to be with someone that's smart, but not vacuous. Kind, but not conceited. It's not much of a demanding trait, if you think about it. Anyway, here's a brief description of me. My name is Rich, 26 years old, Caucasian, and resides in Concord. I'm about average height, slender built, black hair, brown eyes, and black thick glasses. My hobbies include music, art, video games, movies, waxing nostalgia, or just going out for a good time. My ideal partner would reflect similar qualities. Single, slender, built with less vanity issues. If you find the aforementioned information relating to your desires, or if you just want to chat, feel free to contact me. Me. I apologize if this proposal isn't romantic, but it's hard to wear a Prozac smile on this depressing holiday when my heart has been shattered a million times. I thank you in advance for picking up the pieces, though." Unquote. Quote, Last night, 
While taking a shower, I sat there in the corner, hunched in a fetal position. I was honestly paralyzed with a symphony of emotions. The water droplets continued to rain on me as I watched them trickle down my body and into the drain. What I acknowledge from this common perpetual action is how it related to my current situation. Are my goals and ambitions just a product of my own childhood delusions? Constantly coaxing through my mind yet passively circling the drain of rejection? Was this where my life was heading if I didn't take control of it? I continued to contemplate the direction of my career path and what the possible results would be if fully pursued. The road I've traveled has been a treacherous one, yet I still persist in my meandering trek, overcoming certain obstacles that stand before me. Advancing to new territory is what honestly makes the journey exciting. Conversing with different people, acquiring new knowledge, or just embracing the minor achievements that were contributed to those fellow people. Though I show great appreciation for their work, I feel that I'm idly standing by that hollow doorway to which where my primary objective lies. I come prepared. My arsenal of materials in hand with steady confidence intact. What I require to gain access is a person that's well familiar with the natives that dwell within. Someone who can articulate their language and fully comprehend the ideas that I come to bestow. Confliction is what holds me back from scouring the interwebscape for this noble accomplice. My dilemma can be illustrated with a flip of a coin. One side represents success and the other is failure. As it's tossed in the air, I can't help to ponder what side it will land on. Let's consider the two, shall we? Success. Will this lead to greater things? Exposing my creative talent to the masses? Will I be blinded by my own fame? Will I be opted to conform to a certain personality and lifestyle? Will I still communicate with the people that have initially supported me since the day I learned to walk? Failure. Is this freelancing garbage going to be my only source of survival? Will I end up degrading myself to work at a local eatery just to pay the rent? Am I doomed to despondently roam the earth forever, seeking that big break? Is it possible that I can still be a contributing member of society while maintaining my dignity and creativity? I guess it's well indicated that no matter what the outcome is, I'm still fucked. All I can say in response is that these are queries that only destiny can answer. What I've realized is that I should prepare for the inevitable transformation of my career. Geez, when is that coin going to land? Unquote. On this MySpace, he also posted a few more times about his Sonic movie script and ideas and his personal feelings about Sega of Japan having denied him yet again. Much that's said here is all but the same that we've read before, but I think at this point, it was finally starting to set in for Kuda. That this film project that he tried to get off the ground and campaigned for and did so much work for for well over a year wasn't going anywhere that no matter how much he ranted and raved and begged and pleaded, Sega of Japan was a wall he was never going to get through. And what's more is the majority of the Sonic fanbase didn't even believe that he got that far. Despite him showing evidence to prove the opposite, it would seem that Richard was, well, a bit of a laughingstock now. So even if it was true, would anyone take him seriously now? A feverish Sonic fan trying to get a movie pitched to Sega and failing, arguing with the majority of the community, sporting a pompous attitude, secretly posting pictures of himself wearing diapers online, writing what many people would call desperate posts for female attention on a social media, and being an extremely reactive and argumentative person all added up after a while, as well as posting his deep personal and philosophical thoughts that, while poignant, none would ever care to take seriously now. And soon, when all of this built up, word of this man began to spread around online, which of course the community of ED ate up, him being yet another case of a Sonic fan making a fool of himself online. He was even branded by the site as a lolcow, which as quoted by the site itself is defined as 
a victim of a flame war who can't help but be milked for lols time and time again. They have a compulsive need to give up as many laughs as possible at their own expense despite themselves. A good flame warrior can turn even the most dignified poster into a lol cow, dehumanizing them every step of the way. For some unknown reason, with only a few exceptions, the lol cow cannot break the cycle and regain their humanity. The most wonderful examples of lol cows are when the lol cow initially tries tried to set themselves up as a formidable internet entity. A certain dwarf attempted to set himself up as the king of the trolls, but was soon turned into a lolcow by nearly everybody on the internet. Despite his moves of protest and his claims of the greatest of minds, nearly everybody milks him for what they can get. This is usually quite a bit, unquote. If it wasn't obvious, lolcows tend to be people who argue with a large swarm of people, usually hunger for respect of some kind, have failed at something or exposed themselves online for all to see, and don't seem to learn that their best option is to stop trying to save face and gain respect from those who will never give it to them and should rather simply move on and away from that community and perhaps the internet for a while as well. Richard fell perfectly into this category, and all this would cause Rich, for the time being, to hightail it off the internet for a bit, deleting most of his pages and associated social media, perhaps knowing full well when he was clearly defeated in more ways than one. Why do you think so many in the Satam fandom turned away from you and didn't believe you about your movie pitch? Honestly. I think it was ego combined with seeking validation. Because the majority of the fan base accused me of my movie efforts as a poor attempt to be accepted again in, the, in their group. And they're partly right. <laughs> I, I spent years trying to redeem myself from my past transgressions. And, and the harder I tried, the worse I'd make the situation. Because the way I came off made it sound desperate. And if I had the clairvoyance that I have today, I probably shouldn't have said anything and just brush it off as a personal failure instead of inviting other people into it. So, with all this debate and drama over a Sonic movie pitch, some of you might be wondering, what exactly did this pitch entail? Well, I happen to have all the files and associated media connected to this would-be film project. Now keep in mind, some of this stuff would have been edited later due to events we have yet to get to. But with that being said, there were six drafts made up of the script of the film, with the final one being just around 104 pages long. There are character sheets which details basic info about all the main and some side characters that will be featured in said film. A film treatment was also made, that is to say, a document which sums up what the hell the movie would have been about, in as short a burst of time as possible, while still being detailed enough to get a good picture of what the plot and the major ideas, things of that sort. Later on, Rich would also have storyboards made for this film, though we'll get to that part of the story in a bit. But needless to say, with all of this, we can get a fairly clear picture of what Rich's dream movie, at the time, would have been like. Now, unlike Ben Hurst and, frankly, most of the Sonic Sat AM fanbase, Rich's idea wasn't to just simply complete the Sat AM story with a final movie to finish it off. No, 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 no. This film would have been a reboot, one that combines elements of the Sat AM cartoon, the Archie comics, the video games, and elements from Kudo's imagination. This was his idea to not only have these characters from the show come back, which by this point in time outside of the Archie comics were all but forgotten by Sega, but also as a way of hopefully integrating them into the future games, as he had big hopes of this film having game tie-ins, creating a new canon for the franchise at a time when it had just suffered one of the worst years ever with the release of Sonic 06, Sonic and the Secret Rings, and Sonic on the GBA, all of which were bad games slash ports, almost universally hated and mocked, 
and would come to haunt the Sonic franchise forever after. In a sense, you might say Richard's film's aim was not just simply to have these characters be in other Sonic-related media, but to try to heal a franchise that was at one of its lowest, if not its absolute lowest point. On top of all that, Rich actually had plans for not just his first film, but a possible trilogy that he had outlined all the way back in 2005. But with that being said, what exactly was the plot of this movie or possible trilogy? Well, I'll start by reading you the movie treatment Kuda had that he claimed to have shown to a few animation studios, this one specifically being shown to Universal Studios. Quote, Pitch to Universal Pictures, Richard Kuda, October 17th of 2005. Thank you. First off, I really appreciate everyone giving me this rare opportunity to pitch my ambitious project as Sonic has always been an endearing character to me and many others growing up. Plus, my team and I invested two years developing this animated endeavor that incorporates our passion, dedication, and encyclopedic knowledge of the franchise. So in other words, we're aiming to stay faithful to the source material and use a concept that encompasses all aspects of Sonic's repertoire, tied together through a cohesive origin story. And among its devoted fan base, Sonic is viewed as the apex of video game icons has yet to slow down in his career. And throughout his 16 year existence, we've seen him race through video games, embark on quests through comic books, and watched him burn up the airwaves in the Saturday morning cartoons. Many know him as the beloved speed demon that runs across dangerous terrain, fighting evil robots and battling his arch nemesis, Dr. Robotnik. However, many of the aforementioned continuities has yet to explore Sonic's background. So without further ado, I'd like to dive right into the concept. Sonic. Now Sonic is a chili dog munching, road burning blue dude with an attitude. He's a cocky little teenager that's playful, immature, and even impatient. He craves action, speed, and will most likely find it during his many adventures trekking across the planet Mobius. But with a character like this, he's going to need some friends to level him out. Like Tails, the two-tailed fox, Sonic's adorable sidekick with the ability to fly with his two tails. Princess Sally Acorn, a beautiful beautiful, intelligent, yet commanding chipmunk that expresses deep feelings for her hero. Bunny Fields or Bunny Rabot, a sweet southern cottontail rabbit with a heart of gold. Now you may notice that Bunny's limbs are robotic. It's a reminder of the danger these poor creatures face. But what type of cruel individual would find a sick pleasure in such meaningless torture? A human named Dr. Robotnik, a scientist that built an empire governed by robots called Badniks. So what exactly drove a humble scientist to a life of deception, greed, and pure malevolence? Well, let us start from the beginning. In a not too distant future, a scientist by the name of Dr. Ivo Julian Kintobor holds a press conference in Station Square regarding a new energy source that will replace fossil fuels called Chaos Emeralds. These seven fragments were discovered on a mysterious island that contained incredible power with one major side effect the ability to give animals super strength and hyper intelligence. Now, Dr. Kinobor is aware of consequences, but only concentrates on the fame his new discovery will bring him. But before he gets that opportunity, an escape lab rat triggers the power of the emeralds, causing destruction in its path and leading to the annihilation of the human race. Dr. Kintobor evacuates the planet in a spaceship and returns after the dust settles. Given the understanding of Einstein's theory of relativity, he actually returns to Earth in the 33rd century, where anthropomorphic animals have become the dominant species, where they rename the planet Earth to Mobius which is defined as a new start. Revenge transforms to evil as Dr. Kintobor becomes Dr. Robotnik, continuing his relentless search for his precious emeralds, and utilizes his technological skill to create a robotic army to enslave the planet. Four of said emeralds are now guarded in the utopian kingdom of Mobotropolis, ruled by the Acorn family. The other three are treasured by Sir Charles Hedgehog, a retired knight that served under King Acorn. Acorn. Charles, or Chuck, relinquishes one of the emeralds to his six-year-old nephew, Sonic the Hedgehog, who aspires to be just like his uncle and proudly wears the fragment around his neck. Now one day, Sonic and his friend, Princess Sally, are playing a harmless game of tag when they hear a commotion followed by screams of terror far off in the distance. 
tragedy strikes. Dr. King Tabor launches a surprise attack against Mobotropolis for the selfish intent of retrieving his emeralds. An army of badniks attack citizens, level buildings, and capture prisoners. In the middle of all the panic, a baby two-tailed fox is rescued in a crossfire by Bunny Fields. Among all the carnage, Sonic's uncle leads the children on an exodus to a hidden refuge called Knothole Village, who is then captured and transformed into a robot. The poor children end up fending for themselves as they start a new life in solitude. Flash forward 10 years later, a more grown-up Sonic and Tails stumble upon a damaged robot deep in the forest, sporting Robotnik's insignia on it. In disbelief, Sonic gazes off into the distance and sees a factory-like structure warning Princess Sally and Bunny that their old enemy is still looming. As you see, Robotnik's intention for the Chaos Emeralds is to power his most deadliest weapon, the Death Egg, a large space station that's able to disseminate an entire planet. But before his evil plan can come to fruition, Sonic and his friends storm Robotnik's fortress, overcoming great challenges, facing certain peril, and experience personal tragedies along their journey. But with the help of his traveling companions, Sonic is victorious as he's able to harness the power of the Chaos Emeralds, becoming Super Sonic, defeating his egg-shaped foe and liberating Mobian citizens from tyranny. Now, did Robotnik survive his encounter with the speedy Blue Hedgehog? Well, our villain is seen crawling out of the flaming wreckage of his Death Egg as it plummets from the sky and crashes onto Angel Island. He is then confronted by a red echidna named Knuckles. Robotnik cowers at Knuckles' threatening words. Who dares to trespass on my sacred land? Conclusion. Is this the end of our tale? Hopefully not, but it does leave the door open for potential sequels. Advancing the story further, adapting more familiar characters and surrealistic landscapes, as this was originally written as an epic trilogy saga. So as you can tell, there's definitely room to explore more of Sonic's universe, which can ultimately bring future installments to the silver screen and appease fans of all generations. Unquote. Nakuda also wrote a 24-page film treatment in 2005 as well, which is far too long for me to read in full here. It's also a bit too long for a film treatment anyway, since they generally should be around 5 to 10 pages. Though they certainly can be longer, it's generally considered a major no-no unless you're an established screenplay writer or well-established member of the business of film. Film treatments are often written before you take the time to create a script, as they are basically the thing to show off and kind of are a bit of a Kickstarter ad, for lack of a better example, for your potential film to any would-be film studio to read over. That way, as a screenplay writer, you're not wasting time writing screenplays that will never go anywhere. And film studios know the basics of your film before they waste time reading full screenplays every day. I also bring this up to note that Kuda, while passionate, obviously was very new to all of this. But even still, the amount of effort and work that was put into all of these materials is still very impressive. He also made this Sonic movie Hollywood pitch sheet of sorts, where more technical and business-based ideas are shared. Within this document, he showcases himself as the writer and creative executive of this film, and then proceeds with a director idea list, of which has the likes of Brad Bird, Andrew Staten, James Cameron, Jerry Bruckenheimer, and Don Bluth based. He then gives a marketing overview, which I won't go into too much detail here, but it's basically a pitch for why a, a Sonic movie would be a good investment, and what the purpose of this film is. He then compares this film to the likes of The Secret of Nim, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, and The Prince of Egypt, all of which are banger animated films, most of which made big money domestically. He then lists soundtrack ideas, which he has the likes of Green Day, Weezer, Audrey Sessions, and oddly enough, Nine Inch Nails. Nine Inch Nails Robotnik theme win, I guess? Also, as a side note, but an incredibly interesting one, Kuda also worked with an indie band who's very close with Audrey Sessions to have this song specifically made for the film. I won't show it in full here because, I mean, it's a full-ass song, but it is a pretty cool track. And again, it's just crazy to me that there exists a song, an officially made song, made for Kuda's dream Sonic film. Other info like possible actor choices, storyboards, and finally examples of the franchise selling well and being 
being successful across multiple mediums are showcased. Now obviously, had this film ever really been picked up, all of this stuff uh, more than likely would have been changed depending on who's involved with the film. But I suppose this was created more to paint a picture for what uh, this film might be like. And for our purposes, helps in realizing uh, what was going through the mind of its creator, Richard Kuda. Speaking of, then we have the actual script for the film itself. Now I want to give Kuda his best shot here, so I'll take notes from his final version of the script, as well as what can easily be seen in his storyboards he later commissioned for three artists to create. These two are also pretty different from one another, especially with how they open, so it seems like Kuda definitely struggled with how exactly he wanted the film to go originally. As noted in the treatment, he was going to have this long sequence for Robotnik about back when he was Quinto Bar, have a press conference and what have you to open the film. Whereas in the final version of the script, we just see Robotnik escaping from Earth and we hear about what happened afterward from Robotnik's notes up from space. Both still have an opening, opening first act, kinda, where Sonic and the gang are kids. And we have what amounts to a shorter, more clunky version of the episode duology from uh, the Saturday M show, Blast of the Past, where we find out exactly how Robotnik Robotnik took over the world of Mobius. The problem is, with both versions of Kuda's script, is it starts with a prologue before then going into yet another prologue, before we then finally get to the status quo of the film and the rest of the trilogy. The Blast of the Past duology worked so well in the Sadie M show because it was in season 2. We had already had time with these characters and understood the status quo of their everyday lives fighting Dr. Robotnik. So when we finally get the answers to questions like, how did Robotnik take over the world? Where was Sonic and the rest during all of this? How did everyone get roboticized? It was satisfying. I bring this up because I actually really enjoy the idea of Robotnik being the one to essentially destroy mankind and create the very thing he's now trying to rule over afterward. And I also think once Kuda's script gets going on the main plot proper, with the status quo of the characters being their appropriate age and whatnot, it actually has the bones of a pretty dang good Sonic movie. The dialogue can be a little stilted at times, but the main sequence of events is actually pretty decent. Decent. And hell, I'll openly say it, it seems like it would have been a lot better than the first Sonic the Hedgehog movie. But that said, the two openings make the script a little bit messy, and contain information that I think would have been much better to have been talked about, or even flashed back to later in the movie. And in particular, the revelation that Robotnik is responsible for all of Sonic's kind, an accidental god of sorts, is an interesting idea, but would have been better saved for the grand reveal later in this film film or in the trilogy. So in other words, I would have had the opening where it was Sonic and them as kids, Robotnik takes over, but we don't see all the details of it yet, it's just kind of from their perspective. We get the main story proper, and then it's revealed later on the uh, origin story of the universe and Robotnik, blah 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 blah. And more details regarding that could have been revealed later on in the trilogy. Which, speaking of, you might be wondering what the other two films had planned. Well, they aren't as detailed as this first one, but according to Rich's outline from 2005, after the defeat of Robotnik, in the first film, which involves Sonic fighting Metal Sonic um, as a surprise final boss of the film of sorts, and then using the Chaos Emeralds to destroy the Death Egg, which by the way, that whole finale of the script seems super fucking cool and was definitely the best part of it. Robotnik then flies off and away, only to be confronted with Knuckles, which is where the first film would have ended. The second movie's plot is then described as follows. Quote, As the Freedom Fighters celebrate their victory, they return back to Knothole Village and begin to rebuild Mobotropolis with the help of the robotic citizens and Uncle Chuck. Meanwhile, Knuckles accuses Robotnik of trespassing and thievery since he reveals to be the guardian of the Master Emerald. He suspects Robotnik since the Master Emerald sends the usage of the Chaos Emeralds within his vicinity. Robotnik denies those accusations and places blame upon Sonic. Knuckles befriends him and explains how 
more Chaos Emeralds exist on Angel Island. Back in Knothole, Uncle Chuck analyzes the magical golden ring that was left by Super Sonic's last battle. Sally uses Nicole, who reveals that they're the byproducts of the Chaos Emeralds, whose origin lies from Angel Island. Uncle Chuck becomes curious and asks Sonic to investigate where Tails begs to join him. In the reconstruction of the Mobotropolis, Bunny meets Rotor Walrus, who specializes in electronics slash gadgetry, and develops a crush. She invites him to stay in Knothole Village and serves as a handyman to the Freedom Fighters. Robotnik is shown around a town called Mushroom Hill, where the Chaotix reside. The citizens of Angel Island have a similar culture to those of the ancient Mayans. Sonic and Tails arrive on Angel Island and discover the wreckage of the Death Egg by Lava Reef. Upon their scouting, Charmy the Bee warns Knuckles and the other Chaotix of Sonic's arrival. They instruct Robotnik to stay in the village while they handle the situation. Back in Robotropolis, Sally and Bunny return to the reconstructed Mobotropolis and try to reverse the roboticizer to restore all the citizens. They end up failing since the programming is irreversible. Rotor asks Chuck's assistance since they're both specialists in that type of field. As they analyze the machine, Chuck exposes that he was the true inventor of the roboticizer. The intent of the machine was to slow the aging process in elderly citizens, but was reprogrammed by Robotnik during his conquest. Rotor and Chuck transport the roboticizer to Knothole Village, where they continue to reverse its programming. Back on Angel Island, Sonic and Tails are ambushed by the Chaotix, who consist of the following. Vector the Crocodile, Charmy the Bee, Espio the Chameleon, Mighty the Armadillo, and Knuckles the Echidna. Sonic and Tails race through the island, avoiding them, but are eventually captured. Knuckles interrogates Sonic and Tails, and are brought to the Hidden Palace to be punished for their accused crimes. They contact Sally through Nicole using computer communication station linked by Tails. Princess Sally, Bunny, and Rotor come to their rescue. Meanwhile, Robotnik roams off and tries to find the Master Emerald for himself. He returns to the Death Egg where he uses an Egomatic and flies off into a temple of Sandopolis. Deja Vu sets in when he realizes that he's been here before. He comes across ancient markings in the wall that translate to an ancient Mayan prophecy. The Chaos Emeralds are inhabited by Mayan gods, the foretold of a new race of life forms that would undo the mistakes of humans in the year 2012. It becomes clear to Robotnik that Earth was doomed from the beginning, and man's failure would be the result of animals becoming dominant by giving them the chance to redeem man's follies. Sally, Bunny, and Rotor rescue Sonic and Tails and are once again chased by Knuckles and the Chaotix. Angel Island starts to shake as Robotnik is causing a disturbance within the universe. Knuckles then realizes that Sonic and his friends isn't the real enemy and go after Robotnik. Back in Sandopolis, Robotnik approaches the Mystic Ruins and soon finds more small emeralds, which are just valuable instead of powerful. As he gathers the emeralds in Euphoric Bliss, he finds the Master Emerald, which sits upon a high pedestal stool. He becomes blinded with greed and power, and he tries to steal it by using a claw grip suspended from his hovering Egomatic. Sonic and friends arrive just as he's about to fly off of it, but Sonic and Knuckles lash onto the emerald in an attempt to release it, but Robotnik uses a device built in the Egomatic that electrocutes Sonic and Knuckles. As Sonic lies on the ground, Sally throws Sonic a small emerald that forms into a power ring, giving him temporary super speed. As Robotnik departs from Angel Island, Sonic leaps after after him. They struggle as they fly over Mobotropolis. Meanwhile, Sally, Bunny, and Rotor chase after them in a hover vehicle. Knuckles uses his gliding ability, and Tails flies after Sonic. Bunny uses her extendo legs modified by Rotor to help fight Robotnik. Knuckles arrives and recites a spell that causes the Master Emerald to emit rays that paralyze Robotnik. Bunny loosens the Master Emerald and retracts it to the ground with her legs. As they cheer, Robotnik points a gun at her. While everyone screams in terror, Sonic pushes her out of the way, but starts a chain reaction when the laser hits the Master Emerald. A large beam of light causes it to shatter into pieces, where it's spread all over Mobius. Robotnik flies away in the distance. Knuckles becomes devastated of his failure 
to protect the Master Emerald. While everyone confronts him, he states that there's a slight chance that the Master Emerald can be assembled as long as all the pieces are found. Meanwhile, the Shang reaction has released an evil counterpart of Sonic named Shadow on the other side of the planet. The Freedom Fighters return home in defeat, unknown of Robotnik's whereabouts." Unquote. And then finally, the third film, of which the description is a little bit shorter, goes as follows. Quote, Months later, Robotnik regains control of Robotropolis when he hires a spy named Rouge the Bat. Robotnik rebuilds his industrial city and creates more badniks that attack Knothole and Angel Island. Rouge the Bat is promised a handsome reward by Robotnik if she finds the fragments of the Shattered Master Emerald. During her jewel scouring, she's confronted by Shadow the Hedgehog, who proclaims to destroy her. Rouge gets badly injured and Shadow notices the emerald fragments on her. He questions where she found them, leading to Shadow and Rouge joining forces. Knothole Village and Angel Island undergo an epic battle to fight off the Badniks. Shadow and Sonic eventually confront each other, where they prove to be evenly matched. Rouge manages to collect all the emeralds and brings them to Robotnik. She is then betrayed and sent to a redesigned roboticizer. Luckily, she escapes and heads towards Knothole Village where she helps to fight off the Badniks. Sally inquires about her arrival and becomes shocked knowing that she was once in alliance with Robotnik. To redeem herself, she vows to retrieve the Master Emerald and assist the Freedom Fighters. Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Sally, Bunny, and Rotor and Rouge then storm back to Robotropolis and split into groups. Knuckles explains to Rouge about the imminent danger the Master Emerald has in the hands of a human. During their mission, Knuckles and Rouge become close. Sonic, Tails, and Sally end up battling their way through Badniks, where they discover that Robotnik is missing. In his place, Shadow appears out of nowhere and tackles Sonic. Meanwhile, Rotor and Bunny head to the main power generator to deactivate Robotropolis. Everyone then rendezvous and finds out that Robotnik is about to perform the ancient ritual to summon the power from the Master Emerald. As he recites it, the destruction of the universe commences. Knuckles explains to everyone about the ancient human Mayan society societies and their prophecies. In the possession of a human, it causes destruction, but in the power of a strong Mobian, it can be used for the forces of good. Sonic runs over to Robotnik to make him reconsider his plan, since it would mean the end of all life. Robotnik slaps him away and becomes omnipotent and godlike. Sonic and Shadow put away their differences and summon the power of the Master Emerald to become Super. They both destroy Robotnik and save the universe, restoring peace and harmony to Mobius. Knuckles states that since it was prophesized that the humans would eventually meet their fate, their time was over and nothing could stop it. Destruction is a form of creation brought on by a spiritual force that always has and always will be. The last human in existence is eradicated. That sets the balance to Mobius. Shadow vanishes since the Emerald is returned. Bunny decides to stay partly robotic since it serves a valued purpose. Her and Rotor become a couple as well, as well as Knuckles and Rouge. Robotropolis is destroyed once again and rebuilt to Mobotropolis, where all the citizens and Uncle Chuck are de-roboticized. Sonic and Sally become the new rulers of Mobius, and Tails meets a female fox named Fiona. Is evil vanquished forever? Never. But there will always be a hero to stop it. Sonic the Hedgehog. The End. Unquote. So yeah, that's the whole story, or at least it was in 2005. And while I don't want to spend all day going over every part of it, and needless to say, Kude had grand ambitions and ideas for a new Sonic the Hedgehog canon and story for these films. Personally speaking, there's a lot of ideas within these films that I really, really enjoy and I think are pretty cool conceptually. Uh, on the other hand, I also think that the second and third script or concept need a lot of work, as they aren't nearly as fully realized, I think, as the first one. Especially since the second one feels a lot like an in-between story, with new characters being introduced, but there's not really a whole lot going on. And then the third one just kind of ramps everything up to a thousand. So I feel like some things could be switched around. As far as I know, it's never really said where Shadow comes from or what his story is in this one, if it's just completely different or how he's connected to the Master Emerald. I'm sure these are things that uh, if these were made in the full on scripts, they would be more fully realized. But as they stand, they seem sort of like a random set of events that are cool, uh, but 
don't really have like a logical reason for happening, if that makes sense. And that really is the core idea here. Whether you think that all of this sounds pretty cool or pretty dumb is ultimately up to you, but I can at the very least say that they are very creative and interesting, in the same way that an elaborately put together fan fiction is pretty interesting. Had it become a film trilogy we could watch today, maybe I'd be more analytical or even critical about it. But as it stands, it is simply the ideas of a man who was ultimately rejected. And so, rejected fanfiction shall remain. But uh, speaking of fanfiction, the story of this would-be film and the drama surrounding it isn't quite over yet. In fact, it's only really just begun. So, Rich left the fan base, but after all the dust had settled up to this point, Rich did in fact end up coming back in short time and lurked about from place to place, including DeviantArt where he ranted about the Sonic community, well, a lot more. It was around this time that Kuda had come to a realization the Sega was never going to take his movie idea, something which greatly disappointed him, and enraged him for the two years he had dedicated to this idea by now. He had really only two options left. Stop now and walk away from it all, it all living on as a funny story, and moving on to the next project. Or continue down this cursed road of failure, trying to create something which is far outside the scope of one man's doing, and made far worse by the fact that the community that would or could help in this project ridicule it, consider it a joke, and furthermore, honestly, never did and probably never will give it an honest day's chance because of who was at the helm of the project. Kuda stubbornly chose to take the latter option. And so Kuda came up with the idea to do the movie himself, turn this project around into a fan film. The only problem is, is he's only one guy, as I stated before. So, Kuda went to various Sonic-related forums and places, asking for donations and general help with his project, something which many found to be distasteful. On top of that, Kuda also tried to get his artist back on board to help him with this project. The only problem is... Yeah, Kuda had kind of thrown them under the bus for his movie project, uh, stealing Sionex's design to clear his name up from before. On top of that, many of them claimed that he had not paid them for the last time that they helped with his project, so they really weren't open to working with him again. Oh, if only he had been more honest. I mean, it's not as if that guy's design was the only robotic design that was allowed to have him wearing a long fucking coat. Not to mention that it was still a fat Robotnik instead of this super slender one. But all the same, Kuda's pride got in the way, and so those bridges were burned. Kuda would eventually create a Craigslist ad titled Calling All 2D Artists that led to some artists getting this form letter that was later posted up on Encyclopedia Dramatica for all to see which gives a good image of where his headscape was at that particular moment in time. Important to note is also the reaction from many which in this case on the ED page read as follows, quote, Saw Manic's sad attempt to hype himself screams wannabe, as do his egotistical delusions of being a filmmaker, director, owner of a design firm, artist, etc. Unquote. Around this same time frame, Rich also emailed this message to the FUS admin, Rocky, showcasing his anger towards the community that now watches and mocks his every move. Quote, 
Hey man, we need to have a serious discussion. I realize the recent video I posted last week has sparked a lot of mixed reactions in the Sonic community. Of course, the negative comments have stemmed from Sonic HQ, Sonic Stadium, and FUS. I honestly don't understand the hostility and why everyone is biased against me. I simply filmed a documentary that chronicled my struggle and experience with the Sonic movie. I was involved for the sole purpose of exposing the truth. Sega of Japan is working on a Sonic film with a third-party company, and I just wish everyone would open their damn eyes and listen to me. No matter what derogatory comments are thrown at me, no matter how skeptical they are, one fact remains. I have inside dirt on Sega and nobody wants to accept the facts. Why? Just because of the established hatred that stems from six years ago. This seriously has to stop, and my crusade in spreading the truth will never never cease until we collectively probe Sega of Japan, get verification on their movie, and their third party company. The treatment I've been receiving is disgusting, and there's no reason for anybody to post threats against someone that cared enough to get off the claims. I'm staying persistent in my goal. I hold the evidence that Sega is holding back from their fans, and I'm doing everything in my power to spread the word. You can kick me and ban me from the chat room all you want. Want, but realize this, don't ever come begging for my forgiveness once Sega reveals their movie plans. I try to be professional and even nice about this, but seriously, this fandom can kiss my ass. Most of the hate from the Sonic community stems from envy. Whenever anyone makes a proclamation of improving the fan base or contact Sega, they get on their cases since they're too pathetic to do anything themselves. So they drag everyone down to their level so it eliminates competition. This is utterly asinine because the community is supposed to be supportive and lend their assistance whenever they feel something is wrong. This flame war, personal attacks, is of junior high caliber. I apologize for my gripes, but you need this mirror to see what the Sonic fanbase has regressed to. I'm not seeking fame or publicity. I just want this Sega of Japan slash third party issue to be further investigated to cap off this whole ordeal with the movie. By the way, you have my full permission to contact Deke, Universal, and Sega of Japan. I don't mean to be harsh, but the Sonic community in general needs some serious evaluation. Plus seriously, FUS has a few cracks in their foundation that has yet to be fixed. Rich. Unquote. Indeed, the road old Rich had chosen was a foolish one, and a lonely one at that. Many might even ask why he wished to make a movie, a Sonic movie, for a community that clearly saw him as a joke, and in many ways, saw past his act of professionalism. The truth didn't matter. They didn't care about his efforts, they didn't care about his fan film, and they didn't much care for him either. Facts that Kuda couldn't and wouldn't stand for. He needed to be vindicated. He needed them to believe him. He needed their respect. All things they would never, ever give him. If he did indeed go through all of this effort for a Sonic film, which the evidence suggests he did, and for argument's sake, let's just say that he did, as the alternative of him taking photos of himself in front of buildings and going to another state and all that seems almost crazier to me at this point. What did any of that matter at this point? What was Rich really fighting for? Why not simply stop trying to make the film as soon as Sega said no? Did Rich really want to make a passion project that badly? Did he believe in it so much that he was willing to fight against an entire wave of people that wanted nothing to do with him? Did he really want to save the Sonic franchise and fanbase? Did he believe he could even really do that? Or did he just want respect from a community of people who have hated him ever since he made a couple of bootleg copies of Sonic Sat AM? Maybe it was all of these reasons he continued down this erroneous path. But with no one willing to help him, all was certainly lost. He had reached a dead end.
that is. Until one day, old Kuda should end up getting messaged by a rather interesting hooded figure from the Save Sonic Forum from its then admin, the forum being a place for Sonic the Hedgehog protesters of sorts, where fans ranted about their failing favorite franchise and their ideas of how to fix it. The primary issue they had was over Sonic the Hedgehog's then voice actor, Jason Griffith who they hated and wanted to replace with the older and original Sonic voice actor in the games, Ryan Drummond. Richard Kuda saw this as an opportunity of sorts, and he promised everyone that he would make a Sonic fan film, showing everyone his script for the film as well as his general progress. Uh, but to appeal to this said community a bit more, he said that he would try to have Ryan Drummond be the voice actor for Sonic in the film. Even if personally up to this point, Rich had wanted to have the sad AM voice actor of Sonic Jaleel White to voice him. Well, as it turns out, the community of this website was much more welcoming to Rich and his ideas. One of the then admins even saying that Rich's Sonic movie script was one of the best he'd ever seen. This would all lead to the moment when Richard Kuda met this aforementioned hooded figure, an infamous one in his own right, one that I had covered in a previous video, that man being none other than Alex Ed Prin Stairs, otherwise known as Spax 3. Now, for those who don't know who Spax 3 is, well, I made a two hour video on his own story in Sonic adjacent drama on the internet that's like two hours long and contains an interview from the man himself, much like this video. So I suggest if you want a full breakdown of him to go watch that video. But for those who need some sort of TLDR, Spax 3 was a YouTuber who rather infamously protested Sega for changing Sonic's voice actors. He was also one of the first people to make a review of the Sonic 06 game on YouTube. He caught, caught up in literally mountains worth of drama online, took down other people's videos criticizing him on YouTube at the time when that was kind of unheard of, and threatened to sue anyone who became his enemy. Which, speaking of, Spax3 and his crew approached Richard Kuda asking if they could help him out with this film, as Spax and his crew of, of voice actors were interested and believed in Richard Kuda Kuda's cause. This at first seemed like something finally going Kuda's way. A team assembled to start making this fan project more than just a dream in Kuda's mind. But things didn't quite go according to plan. When you went on to make your film a fan project, how and why did Spax 3 get involved? Right when the film was rejected, I jumped on MySpace and DeviantArt to vent my frustrations of the struggle I endured to get this dream project of mine made. And the reactions were mixed in the comments. Some people believed me, some didn't. And that really affected me because I put so much time, money, and effort into this and nobody seemed to care. And it sucks when you don't have a shoulder to cry on, especially in a fan base that has basically exiled you from their community. So a couple days later from that post, I get a response from someone who went by the name Spax3. Now I understand that even though he was infamous for his own discrepancies, I had no fucking clue who he was, but his response was so convincing enough for me to trust him. So I guess in short, he expressed his sympathies for my failures and suggested to revive my project as something fan made. He stated claims of being this quote unquote professional voice actor who had friends that would be willing to assist me. So, you know, his words seemed legit and I continued my conversations with him to see where this would all lead. And as many know, it wasn't anything good. <laughs> it was just a clusterfuck of a production crew since nobody was being professional or taking their roles seriously. So when the fan base caught wind of his involvement, I was dogpiled, which put me in a precarious position of letting him go from the project. But that was inevitable anyway, since his sonic impression was just fucking terrible. <laughs> I, I tried to be delicate as possible, but he went ballistic and started this online drama with me and, and my crew as well, which delayed production. So it was quite the headache he put me through. <laughs> 
So, yeah, things didn't exactly end up working between the two of them. Now, if you want to hear Spax's side of the story, you can go watch my video on him uh, for full transparency. But all the same, this was not exactly a match made in heaven. In fact, while we're on the topic, I might as well jump ahead just once more before moving on. You see, like all of Spax's enemies, Spax threatened to sue Rich over... Business mistreatment? Or maybe it was liable. Or something. Look, none of it fucking matters because nothing came out of it and it was just all internet slappy fights. But Spax 3 would continue to be a thorn in Kuda's side after what he saw as a betrayal and insult of his voice acting talents. To make matters worse, before they even had a falling out when Kuda announced his plans for the Setium movie to be a fan film project and people found out that Spax 3 was associated with it, what little credibility there was left in the project went out the fucking window and it became a point of contention, mockery, and further Sonic Flame Wars online. Spax 3 would also be one of the people who would help in spreading Kuda's ED page around, being sure to air out his enemy's dirty laundry as much as possible, which is sort of ironic because Spax 3 would also come to have not one, but two ED pages made about him, one being the general drama and the other being the specific case of him threatening the Sioux people. But all the same, the two were like this for a while. It was around five years after this spark of a fight that Rich would write the following. Quote, Hey everyone, it's with deep regret to inform all of you that my Facebook has been hacked. For the past couple of days, the individual has leaked out personal info about me, my friends, and family while continuing to pose threats. So unfortunately, I will be restricting activity on here for a while till the dust clears. It's really sad to know that there exist malicious people like this, people that hold grudges against the stupidest things. Whether it's an opinion or a series of harmless videos, this type of behavior is unacceptable. Acceptable. The same person made a similar attempt last year by crank calling me, but the events that have transpired this week have exceeded to dangerous levels of stalking. Considering that this douche nozzle is somehow able to read this since he has a penchant for screen capping all of my activity and posting it on YouTube, I'd like to say this. What the fuck are you trying to accomplish here? You get bent out of shape over the most trivial shit and that somehow just the you to invade my privacy, harass my friends, leak my personal information, and make threats of blackmail. My activity on the internet as of the last year has been less than frequent, because I don't even post on message boards or get involved with internet communities due to the conflict that happened with the Sonic bullshit. In relation, I have a good notion to believe that you're just the spawn of a certain autistic loser's scheme since that guy has had a ridiculous vendetta against me since 2008. If you're this pathetic to where you utilize all your leisure to destroy someone's life, a person who you don't even know for that matter, over something over the internet, then you seriously need to reevaluate your life. It's one thing to attack me, but when you get my friends and family involved, there will be consequences. So go ahead and keep posting shit about me, dick, cause you're now committing a crime and I will use the necessary resources at my disposal to have your ass tracked down and arrested. On that note, I'd like to invite Sega Kool-Aid, Solid Snake Productions, and Spax 3 to die in a pool of AIDS to immature, socially inept, low-life fuckwads. In response to someone who is trying to calm him down and don't give them the reaction and drama they want, he responds with, No, I'm sick of dealing with this junior high bullshit and dealing with these Sonic guys who I haven't been associated with in over a year. So anyone know the number of a hitman I can hire? Someone named Kristen says to do it with art. That's what an artist does. In response, he says, Sorry, Kristen. These fucktards have been a thorn in my ass for five years now. It's time to take action, even if it means murder, because I'm highly considering it. They're responsible for destroying my reputation and sabotaging my projects, and every time I post my art, it gets brutally criticized due to the established hatred these people have against me. Again, this shit stems from the Sonic the Hedgehog community, which is why I left." Unquote. Now, two people mentioned here, Sega Kool-Aid and Saul Snake Productions, I will get to a little bit later, uh, but Neos 
say they were very dedicated trolls to documenting Richard Kuda's happenings and generally making fun of him and making sure he couldn't be taken seriously no matter where he went. In response, Spax said the following. Quote, Rich Kuda is actually threatening death on me and two others. I don't do much aside from tell him the truth and criticize him for it, and many others do as well. But the two others make videos on him which I do make myself or give any direction on. I think he meant to say, don't make myself or give any direction on. Though I am allies with them and don't mind it. But I am not involved with the video making. I've been more mature towards Rich as of late, and I would have been in the past, which is hard considering who he is. However, if he's serious on trying to kill me, then I'm going to be calling the police on him. He does live in my area, so if anyone has ever dreamed of seeing Kuda arrested, you may get your chance." Unquote. Once again, nothing came of any of this, but to say that these two hated each other, um, would be a bit of an understatement. On top of all of this, on March 16th of 2009, Sega sent Kuda a cease and desist notice due to his constant pestering of the company with his proposals. It would seem he was still, even while trying to make a fan film, trying to get Sega to make this movie, making this the second time the company have had to send Kuda a notice. On top of that, Kuda also realized that some of his closest friends were leaking his messages to ED, notably Sonic, the ex-owner of FUS, who had apparently made up with him before, these leaks including the news of his cease and desist letter, an ultimate defeat for him as well as a betrayal, and he reacted with the following message. Quote, oh my god, what the fuck is your problem? You just won't stop, will you? Fine, you bitch. Keep adding shit to my ED page. This has solidified my decision. I've reached my boiling point. Fuck this fan base. I'm done. Put a bullet in that rodent's head and end his misery already. I refuse to belong to a community that's full of corruption. Sonic used to be enjoyable but it's not. It was one of my many recreational hobbies to engage in to escape from the negativity of real life. I have not been happy since 1999, and if people are constantly attacking one another and violently humiliating people for their own sick pleasure, then I won't have any association with this franchise. The only things this franchise is good at creating is enemies and failure. I'm sorry guys, I'm getting too old for this shit, and this entire time it's been nothing but stress and frustration. Go ahead, Neek. Add this to my ED page. What's the point of even reasoning with you? You're going to post it anyway, you immature prick. Why don't you start acting your age instead of pulling this junior high shit? For nine years, you've been the main cause of my afflictions. For being a colossal bitch. You are devoid of human decency and respect because all you are capable of is spread hate. You single-handedly destroyed my good name over the years, and I hope karma bit you in the ass hard. My friends and I trusted you, cause we assumed you turned a new leaf. These recent actions further validate the lying, deceitful shit you are. Unless people can behave like civil adults, I won't be returning. So before I depart, I leave you with these inalienable truths. Sad AM is never coming back. Sega will never listen to their fans, and the fanbase will continue to be shit to everyone. My respect for the Sonic fanbase is dead, just like the franchise. After 16 years of contributing to the Sonic community, it saddens me to say that there's no faith in restoring it. Goodbye everyone, and I hope you rot in hell, Neek." Unquote. And just to top it all off, Kuda was also banned from the Saturday morning Sonic forums around this same time, uh, due to all of this drama as more as more drama associated with the owner of the site. On that note, Kuda also took the time to reflect upon this last decade, sometime around this as well, but not just for his movie project, but his life in general up to that point. Quote, What can I say that hasn't been vented before? This decade sucked. The only saving grace of it was our advanced technology and the exposure of indie rock. Ever since 2000, I began attending more concerts than I ever have. The thrill of watching someone new and upcoming had a special charm to it, and I'm grateful that these local bands helped shape my career and exposed me to music that I never knew existed. In terms of mainstream music, Green Day made an incredible comeback, with both American Idiot and the 21st Century Breakdown. Much as I can say about Radiohead. No offense, but 
kid is a boring drab which drones on and on and on and on. It perplexes me how pretentious music journals, such as Pitchfork Media, continues to praise this album as the best of the decade. When I was in college, I remember so many indie snobs who would claim it was the apex of Radiohead's career, and they'd debase people as having no taste in music if they didn't agree. The type of people that listen to only vinyl records and wear tight-fitting clothes with 80s icons on them. Believe me, Radiohead has done better. In Rainbows was their redemption from releasing slow moaning electronic garbage as for technology, MySpace, Facebook, Twitter gave us the innovation of meeting new friends and reuniting with old ones. In fact, my 10 year old high school reunion was organized through Facebook since it was uh, more efficient than mailing out letters. On the same topic of technology, Nintendo Wii rekindled my lost interest in video games in 2006. Ever since the advent of X Xbox, PS2, and GameCube, I was somehow turned off by the games, but it was the Wii that brought us motion sense interaction and made game fun instead of gritty. World affairs and politics have been a societal burden, but my god, the ineptitude of Bush's leadership amazed me too, where you couldn't keep away from CNN to see what other bumbling screw-up hell caused next. I can honestly attest that Bush was the worst president in American history. My personal life has significantly significantly gone downhill. In 2000, my dad kicks me out since he wanted to be alone with his girlfriend, who later became my stepmom. Most of my friends moved to the out-of-state colleges, and I'm only left with three people at most that I stuck around in my area. I lost my virginity to some inconsiderate bitch who I thought was my soulmate. My career has been winding down a path of uncertainty, and economy hasn't been helping either. Sure, I worked as a freelance graphic designer, but the overall job isn't stable. Let's see. My mom developed breast cancer, and my aunt recently died of liver cancer. So that pretty much wraps up this delightful little decade in a nice package. Oh, since you guys already know my views on TV, cartoons, and movies, I'll just end it on that." Unquote. Now, you won't believe this, but despite all of this, Kuda still pushed forward with what little artists, friends, or whoever was willing to help in trying to make this Sonic film a thing. Despite saying he was going to leave the fan base like literally 10 times over at this point, despite him being a laughingstock nearly everywhere he went by now, Kuda refused to let this idea die, and so he persisted. But while this was all being worked on, something far, far more infamous was brewing over on this cool little website called YouTube. Yes, indeed. Kuda also had a YouTube channel as well. He went by a not whole resident, which if you hadn't noticed by now, is a username that he was using a far more often across various forums during this point in time. Which speaking of, this one's a little bit off topic, but an important note in this YouTube video all the same. You see, back in June of 2007, Kuda would make an epic rant video about this local Weezer fan board he frequented, known as Weezer Nation, where Apparently, he had been taunted and trolled, though the exact details of this taunting and trolling are a bit fuzzy. What's also fuzzy, yet far more clear, is this video that I'll now play in full. And now, a written statement by Richard Kuda to Weezer Nation. Good afternoon. Pretentious indie snobs and pseudo-intellectuals of Weezer Nation, I come bearing a message of great concern regarding the recent activities coming from this community. For the last year, I've been the subject of a sick game that obviously hasn't diminished. Revealing information and depictions of my personal life have been exploited for the intent of someone's cruel, twisted joke. And considering that this has been a constant occurrence, I've decided to express my true feelings to dis to display how much this fucked up message board has affected my life. Now a certain someone, namely, this is a gay man, apparently has an unhealthy infatuation with me. 
I noticed that my MySpace blogs continue to surface on the message board, considering that my profile has been set to private. Now there's speculation that one of my friends has been betraying me and sending this douchebag my entries. And what is the fucking purpose of this? Just to rip apart my grammar, spelling, diction, and daily life? Are you shitting me up the ass? How fucking pathetic does someone have to be to constantly play teacher with a blog entry? It's the goddamn internet, not the Writers Guild of America. See, this is an example why a lot of people are leaving this particular community. It's full of arrogant fucktards that can't get off their high horse. It's a fucking blog entry, goddammit. Get on with it, man. While I'm on the topic, are you people that conceited that you actually think I post entries and updates on my site just to impress you guys? For fuck's sake, you need a serious evaluation. I post for the sole purpose of informing my friends and family about my recent agenda. Not only that, I run a business where it's imperative for me to update them on my projects. But none of you would understand, since you're all losers, that can only hope to accomplish such a goal. Now, my schedule is very occupied, especially since I've been in development of a feature film that has recently taken notice at a Hollywood studio that shall remain nameless. My career is in potential danger, since you assholes, particularly this is a gay man, have been posting pictures of me on YouTube and spamming my IMDB boards. And you know what? It's even come to the point where they've actually crank called me. This immature bullshit has to stop and only proves how pathetic and unprofessional this message board is ran. I'm, I'm no longer asking, I'm threatening that you all cease and desist these junior highish antics immediately or I will take the appropriate action in getting Weezer Nation officially shut down. I'm dead fucking serious, cause this shit has gone to the point where it's jeopardized my business, my career, and even my life. You may think it's funny to mess around like this, but you need to realize that you're fucking over the life of another human being, and knowing that none of you have shown signs of remorse indicates how malicious and despicable you people really are. I've said this many times in the past, but now that I'm in front of the camera, I want to make this official. I fucking resign from your shitty ass community. As for you, this is a game man. Continue what you're doing. You may think it's hilarious how you have an arsenal of dirt that could quickly ruin my reputation, but just remember this. You're a sad excuse for a person, and I, sin and I sincerely feel sorry for you that you must leech off the life of successful people like myself to mask your own depravity and jealousy. So with that said, I appreciate you all listening to my rant, and I can only hope there's at least one of you who has a shred of dignity who actually finds this shit to be ridiculous. So Weezer Nation, go fuck your face through your asshole, you dicks. And for you, this is a gay man, you better hope we don't confront each other in a dark alley one day, because you'll find yourself on the ground. I'm dead serious. You know, for all the pain, and emotional, and emotional suffering that you've put me through, you fucking deserve it. And I can't wait for that day to come. Now if you excuse me, I have a life to live. Now if this video wasn't enough, apparently the Weezer Nation message board wanted to troll Kuda one more time after his departure. After what is described as an intense phone conversation, Rich was apparently convinced that he was being hacked slash spied on by someone in England. Someone who I'm guessing was one of the main users slash trolls of the a Weezer Nation board. Kuda then received a mysterious email from Mark Jackson of the Department of Internet accounts, protocols, evaluations, and reprimand. A supposed government anti-online bullying organization so secret that they don't even have a website. For almost an entire week, Kuda began his pursuit to officially shut down the Weezer Nation message board. However, his crusade with Mark Jackson came to a complete halt after Kuda discovered his government agency had a rather interesting acronym. 
Now, there are actually a ton of videos that Kuda made under the account of a not whole resident, uh, but unfortunately, most of them are seemingly completely lost to time. A true loss for all those internet historians, such as myself. myself with this one guys <laughs> okay I'm gonna calm down I'm calm down all right what do you get when you cross an FMV game with quick time elements and controls that handle like a fucking tank <laughs> you get this pretentious piece of shit <laughs> I don't understand why this game was overly hyped and it just reminds me of those horrible 3DO games like Phantasmagoria. It is so boring, it put me through paralysis. You have to engage yourself in all these mundane activities to the point where it's driving you to the brink of insanity. How can anybody find this remotely entertaining? Or even enjoyable for that matter? I could barely get through an hour of this game and I'm already finding myself getting frustrated over it. Oh god! But <laughs> as much as I'm so livid about this game, it's just hilarious how people think that this is the next uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, thing in technology, and this is going to be the uh, thing that's going to usher a new revolution in 3D gaming. No! It's fucking stupid! It's boring! It's mundane! It's... it's... it's ASS! <laughs> that's right, guys. I'm stealing that line because it's just so appropriate to really deliver what my concise feelings are about this uh, horrible piece of shit. Heavy rain, don't play it. But luckily for us, the most famous one of them all still very much remains online. The Sonic 4 Rant. Now, if you had ever heard of Richard Kuda before, even in passing, there was probably three things you know about him, or at least one of these things you know about him. He tried to make a Sonic movie, he wears diapers, and he made a Sonic the Hedgehog 4 video ranting about Sonic's green eyes. To say this video blew up, his presence online is an understatement. It's lived on as one of the more cringy reaction videos of all time. For context, Kuda, like many Sonic fans of the time, was eagerly awaiting Sonic 4, a before called Project Needle Mouse, which after all the shitty fucking games Sonic had had over these last few years, was supposed to be a return to form for the franchise going back to its roots, a term that is all too familiar and sad to hear these days. The expectation of the time was that this was going to pick up where Sonic 3 left off. Think something similar to Crash 4, what it did for its franchise franchise, or if you need something Sonic-related, Sonic Mania. That's what was expected. And, well, I'd like you to see Kuda's reaction in full before I go further. But keep in mind, I will be adding the actual trailer for Sonic 4, the reveal trailer, that he watched all the way back then for reference in the corner. But do note that this actually was not there originally. In the original video, it was just his potato camera quality ass face, as well as his Sonic plushes face, I suppose. Hey everybody, this is a Not Whole Resident. As you can see here, I am very pumped up about Sonic the Hedgehog 4. I've been getting tons of comments about it. The trailer was just released, and I'm going to go ahead and watch it live here on YouTube. So here we go, everybody. This is the Sonic 4 trailer and my initial reaction live, caught on video. So here we go. You ready for this, buddy? We waited over, what, 16, 17 years for this? It's your long-awaited comeback, yay! Here we go! Sonic the Hedgehog 4! <laughs> oh, classic! Yeah, Sonic 3, yeah! 
Oh, there's a motor bug! Buddy, uh, this is not exactly what I anticipated. Here, why don't you sit over here? Let the, uh, let the adults speak. You're, you've been under a lot of stress lately, especially for the past five months. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Where to begin? <laughs> Where to begin? Sega. Sega, Sega. Let's talk for a second. What part of retro don't you understand? From the amount of concept art and the black-eyed Sonic you used in the, Hed in the Hedgehog Day banner, that immediately gives us old-school fans the impression that Sonic 4 would reflect the classic Genesis games. And I'm just not seeing it here. I mean, I'm not sure if you caved into the little kitties again, because all I'm seeing here is a rehashed Sonic Rush game ported to the consoles. The same ugly, stretched out, green-eyed Sonic fighting the modern style Eggman. Is that what he's gonna be called too? Dr. Eggman? Ugh! I'm so infuriated right now. This is a complete turnoff. It's, it's incredibly misleading. I mean, Sega, you have a lot of nerve. No, you have a lot of balls to even place this as a long-awaited fourth installment because it just conjures up the same shitty garbage from the 3D games. I mean, I'm looking at this right now in disgust. I mean, this is appalling. This is abysmal. I mean, I, along with most people in their late 20s, was expecting the classic-style Black-Eyed Sonic. This is... Oh, wait, that's Tails. <laughs> so stressed out I can't even concentrate. This is Sonic! This is the classic Sonic! I bought this plushie in 1994! Look! Beady black eyes! What I'm seeing here! The same ugly, stretched out, bubblegum abomination I had to suffer through for the last decade! Ugh! Oh, and so pissed off right now. It's like the Sonic cycle has started again. I mean, where is the classic Sonic? The classic black-eyed, beady-eyed Sonic fighting Dr. Robotnik in the classic Genesis form? Is that so hard to understand? I mean, granted, the level design and the gameplay looks aesthetically pleasing, no gripes there, but it's the feeling of nostalgia that's completely lost. There is nothing like Mega Man 9, because Mega Man 9 was like a worthy installment to the Mega Man series. 8-bit graphics. It's consistent. Where is the consistency? I see nothing here. This is a rushed out port game from a DS title that's downloadable for the console. That's all it is. It's a fucking Sonic Rush game. You know what? I, I am not even going to classify this as a legit Sonic 4 title. I am not even going to place this in the classic library of Genesis games. Hell no. Fuck that shit. This entire marketing hype did nothing but set us up for disaster yet again. And you know what's really sad? You know what's really depressing about this whole thing? I mean... I can't even speak here. I'm just lost for words. I'm looking at the trailer and I, I'm just... I don't know what to say. I mean, my reaction is is teetering on on insanity here. I, I mean, we've waited nearly six months for this game, and this is what you give us? I mean, this is depressing. This is pathetic. If this is supposed to be a 2D comeback, I'm not buying it. Literally, I'm not going to buy this game 
because the the amount of effort the the all the uh, the marketing schemes the way it was hyped up to appease us older fans I see five percent of that ooh 2d gameplay that's not good enough I see the same shitty Sonic and Robotnik from the adventure games the 06 games unleashed library continues but this is not retro I'm sorry I do not have any feelings of nostalgia this is not the worthy follow-up to Sonic 3 and Knuckles I'm sorry Sega you failed in delivering 3d games and you failed in delivering 2d games fuck you I'm done with this franchise where's the damn pause button oh there we go no before I go I think Sonic weeps for Sonic Team and everybody at Sega because us old school fans we had a lot of faith in what you had to show and you let me and this poor guy down and you're gonna have to live with that for the rest of your life goodbye it's uh pretty bad to be fair, so was Sonic 4. That game fucking sucks in retrospect. So I guess Kuda was technically right about this game being a massive piece of shit, but the green eyes part was sort of um, losing the forest through the trees, you know? Not to mention, I get he was trying to do a skit, but pretending like he hadn't seen it before then, and, you know, talking with Sonic about, well, buddy, I guess you're gonna have to wait. It... Yeah, it, it, just, it just didn't, uh, it didn't quite land, uh, let's just put it that way. Now, obviously, many came to this video to mock him relentlessly, in both the comments and the response videos. And in return, Rish would make two more rant videos arguing and fighting back the mob he had unknowingly unleashed. However, in the end, he would come to delete those videos. The two response videos, unfortunately too, seemingly lost the time. But he did leave this this comment as a sort of sand off to it all. Quote, I removed the string of rant videos, cause apparently this generation is devoid of intelligence and would rather drink the Sega Kool-Aid than rather think for themselves, unquote. Which provoked this response from user Ragdoll98. Quote, oh yes, not nitpicking about the fucking color of Sonic's eyes makes us devoid of intelligence. Why don't we complain about how the next-gen consoles have no blast processing? Or how the game is on digital download and not cartridge-based? You know what we should be worried about? We need to worry about what fucking shade of white Sonic's gloves will be. Have fun watching old episodes of Sad AM every night alone in your bedroom. Unquote. Richard wasn't done, however. Over on his usual spots, Rich began to rant and rave about how series villain Robotnik is being called Eggman these days by Sega. Something which, well, uh, perhaps I better just read you the posts. Quote, well guys, prepare for Sega to reach into your childhood memories and scoop out everything you remember from the classics. They pulled a Lucas with the new Sonic collection for the DES. Notice anything different about this story synopsis? It's one thing to bastardize the current state of the franchise, but Sega crossed the line in bastardizing the past. I don't care if Eggman is his real Japanese name. In America, the Sonic games and the booklets called him Dr. Robotnik! What the fuck is Sega's problem in letting us call him Robotnik in the West? I feel like that horrible name is being shoved in our faces, and now it's desecrating my childhood memories of these classic games. Nobody in the 90s ever called him Dr. Eggman, at least here in America. Not kids on the playground, not magazines, or even TV commercials. My god, let us call him Robotnik again, especially if it's for the classic Genesis games. And another thing, why do they constantly advertise the classic games with the modern style Sonic? When it comes to false advertising, Sega seems to only succeed with that. I'm 
fucking tired of this whole updating crap, especially to the original games. This seriously crosses the line. How about if I just made a few changes to the Declaration of Independence, or just add a mustache to the Mona Lisa, because I think it looks better. Yeah, altering history is fun, because the little kitties will be oblivious to the real history, and we can't have that, can we? To this day, I still have to correct these stupid kids in the game stores that his name is Dr. Robotnik. A couple weeks ago, I was wearing my Sat AM shirt, the one that came with the special edition Sat AM DVD box set, and this kid compliments it by saying, is that Eggman? He looks different. I didn't really say anything to cause a scene, but in my mind I wanted to correct that poor ignorant fool. What has Sega done to this generation? You have to understand. That in the 90s, nobody ever called him Eggman. NEVER! Sure, the name was plastered on the Winged Fortress, which raised questions, but nobody really put much thought into it since his name was marketed as Dr. Robotnik. Since the internet didn't exist when Sonic 2 was released, there was no way to know that it was his Japanese name. In the cartoons, comics, games, merchandise, and commercials, it was a shock to us Americans when his name was changed to Dr. Eggman in 1999, and it's been shoved in our faces ever since. So when you're raised with the name Dr. Robotnik, and it drastically changes to something less menacing, it destroys everything the character used to represent, and draws away its older fans. I don't care if it's his original Japanese name. It doesn't work here in the West. It should have been very clear by now, after a decade of failure. Eggman is a literal name. It's why his name was changed to Robotnik so it could sell better in America. It worked in the 90s, so I don't see why it wouldn't work now. It would actually make him a credible villain again. And the reason nobody complains about Bowser or King Koopa is because they're both cool names, unquote. Yeah, so to say he felt left behind would be putting it lightly. You know, I actually like the name Dr. Robotnik a lot better than Dr. Eggman, admittingly, but you see the difference here is Kuda, like Spax, had grown so passionate for this series about a fast blue rodent that he seemed to be going absolutely crazy at this point. At some point, seeing Sega as this giant dragon that he must slay in order to save his precious Sonic, or perhaps Sally Acorn would be more apt. But all the same, Kuda was, uh, going a bit nutty. Quote, I think so much damage has been done from Sega and the fan base in the last decade that it will take years to rectify the franchise to its glory. The problem is that the next gen fans essentially control the communities and they refuse to research Sonic's past because they always say times have changed to move on. Plus, while the old school fans try to encourage the younger fans to at least read the comics, watch Sat AM, or play the old games, they of course gloss over them and assume we're retro purists. That's not it at all. We just care about good material. Then these morons think demanding for quality products is considered pretentious. I feel like I'm in that movie Idiocracy, where the future is full of lazy, apathetic heroes that live in their filth and blindly accept crap. If people aren't courageous enough to call out Sega on their BS, that's where we're headed. The games will continue their downward slope, because nobody was either brave or smart enough to acknowledge the imperfections." Unquote. In response, user Saber16 wrote the following. Okay, you really need to calm down. I mean, apathetic is just a video game character. Why do you give a damn about which Sonic kids prefer? They're not bothering anyone. Look, everyone is welcome to their own opinion, but that's no excuse to be an ass. Unquote. Which Kuda responded with the following, quote, Why care? Because I'm concerned about the history of the Sonic franchise, which is gradually dying. Nobody of this generation seems to care about Sonic's past anymore, and even Sega themselves are guilty of this. If kids today are going to purposely reject the past and ignore the old school fans' wisdom of what made the franchise great, then who's going to pass down that info to future generations? It's going to get to the point where names like Mobius, Robotnik, and Sad AM will cease to exist due to this constant negligence, and I refuse to let that happen. 
unquote. As a side note, Kuda's reasons are interesting. Since those things, besides maybe the name Robotnik on occasion still being used here and there, did indeed mostly go away. But then again, by the time he was complaining about that here, these things were already in fairly full effect outside of the Archie comics, which are also now gone. On a personal note, I feel as though Rich often has a couple of decent points once in a while about the Sonic franchise. Predictions that were often right on the money. And at the core of the problem, I think Rich wanted the Sonic franchise to take itself seriously for these darker, more interesting stories of the past to continue forward. Which, if you are at all familiar with Sonic YouTube or Sonic games or the franchise, you'll know that there was a good 10 year span of time called the meta era in which the Sonic franchise pretty much gave up narratively and decided it was going to not take itself seriously pretty much at all. Which, regardless if you actually care about that or not, it is an interesting observation retrospectively all the same. But, and this is a big but, all of Rich's predictions, opinions, and thoughts are so often buried under theatrical language, broad accusations, and again, focusing on tiny details of a far bigger picture. He's too quick to jump to ad hominems and blame people over things that ultimately they have no fucking control over. And when he does those things, it becomes extremely easy to see why no one took him seriously after a while, in spite of him having a few good predictions of exactly where the Sonic franchise would be going for years to come, whether it was accidental or not. I suppose it's all about the delivery of your messages. And as they say, a good letter is always lost in the fire. What's more is with each new message Richard wrote, where he grew more and more angry at the fanbase and community that mocked him and didn't take him seriously, he only grew more desperate and angry for people to listen to him, which only made it funnier for those same people. And so they mocked him more, which eventually morphed him into this self-destructive individual that believed that he was the only one who could save the franchise franchise he so loved, that it was him against the world. If he didn't do it, then who would? He would save the Sonic franchise, because he was the only one that could. A Sonic fanbase induced psychosis, you might say. Maybe this anthropomorphic cartoon animal madness was why, amongst the other things made on Kuda's channel, this video of him candidly talking about his love for wearing diapers was something he thought was at all a good idea to share online on such a public space. Does anyone else find it endearing that after nearly 40 years that Sesame Street is still a relevant TV show for kids of this generation? <laughs> and you know what? I'm glad they're keeping up tradition. Hey everybody, this is Mr. Chipmunk Mobian here to give you a brief update about um, some of the current events that have been transpiring in the past couple weeks. Um, I felt kind of compelled to make this video here since um, certain videos have leaked on the internet regarding my personal life and I wanted to take the opportunity to finally come out into the open and become more uh, sincere about it since for the past couple years or so I've been kind of in denial about the whole subject matter and I think that this would be the appropriate time to uh, you know clarify some of the misconstrued information that people have been projecting upon me regarding this whole adult baby lifestyle. But I guess the intent of this particular video here is to educate those that are somewhat ignorant of the whole adult baby culture and just try to shed some light on some of the positive aspects of it rather than the negative connotations that are associated with it from the general public. So let's begin. An adult baby is somebody that exhibits the mentality and physical attributes of being a toddler. And what you do is you just kind of provide the attire, like a footed sleeper or rompers or, or onesies or diapers, of course. And you just kind of create your own atmosphere, like I have over here. And what you do is you just kind of transport yourself back into that innocent moment of childhood. And it's nothing more than just harmless escapism. There's nothing sexual about it. 
I know there's some AVs that do take it to an extreme level, but for me, it's a pure, tame recreation. The whole concept didn't really trigger my interest until I was 12 years old. I came home from school one day, I think it was either 6th or 7th grade, and uh, I went to hang up my coat in the family room closet, and, well, a pack of Pampers just fell on me, and since we had a narrow hallway back then, it just knocked me against the wall. And I thought the whole idea was kind of funny, because it was diapers. I mean, you just laugh that off. It's like, what are these doing in here? And I put them away casually and just attended to my homework. But back then, I used to watch afternoon cartoons, because back in the 90s, they actually showed cartoons in the afternoon, like Fox Kids and such. And what I found ironic about the programming that day is the fact that every episode of Bobby's World, Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, they showed nothing but baby-related episodes, and that just kind of channeled something inside me, just to experiment. So what I did is I shut the door, closed the blinds, because I was so paranoid about it, since uh, I knew my parents weren't going to understand, or they would probably freak out if they even knew that I was, that I even discovered like a vintage pack of Pampers just hanging out in the closet. But yeah, so what I did is I closed the blinds, I ran upstairs, and I was so apprehensive about the, the act I was going to take part in, because what I did is I, I was constantly looking outside, worried about a car coming up, pulling into the driveway and my dad coming in or something. So what I did is I I ripped open the package, I put the diaper on, and it was such an exhilarating feeling. I mean, it's, it's so indescribable, I, I can't really go into detail about it. It's like, it transported me to that innocent time of being a toddler. And I guess this kind of segues into, well, some of the mental state that I was going through during junior high since, well, my parents were bickering all the time. They filed for a divorce a couple months later, and it just created so much family turmoil during that time. And I don't know, I, I guess psychologically, I kind of yearned to be back in that happy family unit that everybody was so used to. Flash forward to high school. This is when I started hanging out on AOL chat rooms, and um, yeah, it was so primitive back then because all we had was chat rooms. And I just randomly typed in diapers in, in the keyword search, and I was just bewildered by all these chat rooms involving people that like to wear diapers or be babies. But back then, I didn't even know what an adult baby or a diaper lover was, or even a baby fur, or even a furry because these terms weren't really coined until early in the 2000s. So what I did is I started chatting with all these other people, and I don't know, it just, it just really interested me. I mean, yeah, I was involved with sports and other artistic activities. I played video games, listened to music, but this particular recreation just uh, really gravitated my interest because it was just so unusual but fun at the same time. So, when I was talking to all these anonymous people that I never met, some of them suggested that I try on baby clothes or throw in baby accoutrements like a baby bottle or a pacifier, and it, it was so fun. I mean, again, it has nothing to do with any sexual arousal, it's not a fetish to me, it's all about role playing, that's all it is. I mean, you're just trying to recapture that childhood spirit and just relive it for, for a temporary amount of time before you gotta engage in adult activities. Like again, I have about a couple more minutes before I gotta go to work. Well, not a couple minutes, but like an hour and hour and 35 minutes. But yeah, anyway, I'm kinda getting off track here. So yeah, during high school I kind of experimented a bit. I, I started buying adult diapers because, uh, well, I obviously couldn't fit in baby diapers anymore. And then after that, it just kind of evolved into something something interesting. So then during college, that's when I started hanging out with AB communities, and uh, I started attending all these AB get-togethers and parties, and I even threw some of them myself. And that's when I had my studio apartment, and I decorated half of my apartment into half a nursery. 
because half of it was dedicated to more adult stuff, because I had posters of music and video games and movies, while the other side catered more to my childhood side. So you had Sesame Street, um, Rugrats, um, just everything that kind of represented my childhood, and I think I perfectly recaptured that atmosphere. So here we are today. Um, I'm still engaged in these activities. Um, I just recently told my parents, my friends, and everybody that I actually care about about the whole uh, lifestyle, and they were pretty accepting of it. So let's talk about the diapers. I'm sure that's one of the most central topics that people constantly bring up when it comes to adult babies. They always talk about, oh, that's unsanitary, oh, that's disgusting, oh, are you a pedophile? No. Basically, the diaper is almost like a piece of clothing. It's an article of clothing that completes the ensemble because it kind of it, it helps emulate that that illusion of being a baby because if you just wear the baby clothes and everything you're just halfway there but when you're actually wearing the diaper and you know drinking from your bottle and watching cartoons and cuddling with your plushies and everything it just creates a warm secure atmosphere that you kind of yearn for when you were a kid. And a lot of people are probably going to ask, uh, well, do you, you, do you kind of use the diaper for its intended purposes? Sometimes, but I do want to clarify that I absolutely do not go number two. And there's several reasons for that. Number one, it's just unsanitary. I mean, when you, when you actually mess your diaper, it's not a pretty sight to clean, and it's, it's so tedious as well, because let's just say that, uh, well, I did it a couple times, like several years ago, and it's just something I don't want to do again. It's just too much of a hassle, but I don't want to go into detail. Uh, the other factor is now that I'm living in a house full of other people, I got to be more respectful and show some etiquette. And if you do defecate in your diaper, the odor just kind of lingers and it's kind of difficult for that smell to get fumigated. Sometimes I'll wet, but for these particular ones, you just can't do that because they're novelty diapers. And what I mean by that is that they're designed for aesthetic purposes rather than absorbency. I mean, what they do is they, they kind of recapture the late 80s, early 90s style of Pampers. They use the same material, the same designs, it's, it's almost cosmic in that sense. They use two tapes instead of four, and it, it just really completes the whole fantasy, and that's what I really like about it. I guess in conclusion, I just want people to have more of an open mind, explore new avenues, understand that life is an adventure, it's what you make of it. You shouldn't be bound out by, by societal rules. Just because you were conditioned at a young age that there's a certain mapped out way to live. So just do what you want. Have fun. I mean, if people question it, just try to be reasonable, try to be rational, and explain to them why it brings you a certain type of contentment. Hey, I just want to come in front of the camera in a more serious tone instead of in my baby tone, because I know some of those videos were a little bit unnerving. So I just wanted to prove that, yes, I'm still mentally here, and again, I do have a full-time job, I got a girlfriend, so I do have an active adult life as well. So this is Mr. Chipmunk Mobian saying, you're only as old as you feel. Bye. It is really coming down. As you might imagine, this too was ridiculed online. Meanwhile, could have been managing to put something together, a trailer of sorts for a Sonic movie in the background of all this inconsequential internet quarrels. One that even led to him yet again leaving the fan base and only sharing info about his movie project with a few people online now. Boy, this is starting to sound like we've been here before, huh? Anyway, he deleted a bunch of his accounts, pretty much everything that was surrounding the name of Not Whole Resident online during this time frame. Telling the Sonic community doesn't care about what they think anymore, and so on and so forth. As a secondary side note, I'd also like to say that during this time, one of the other videos from Richard Kuda, created for this channel before it was deleted, uh, was something kind of interesting, uh, oriented towards the Sonic Stadium cartoon. 
It's a video where Richard Kuda pretends he's being interviewed by someone answering their questions as to why he enjoys Sonic. And it's, um... What really got me hooked on Sonic was the Saturday morning series that aired on ABC, or as it's appropriately dubbed by the fan base, Sadayam. Uh, opposed to the cartoon that ran in syndication on the UPN network, it had a certain charm to it that has yet to be matched in today's standards. And I mean, it had that sci-fi, fantasy, cyberpunk atmosphere to it, which was a genre, that was a genre that I was heavily into. Still am, actually. <laughs> but in the annals of Sonic's history, I always felt that Sadium was a result of Sega's brilliance. I mean, even though Deke Entertainment created and produced the show, Sega themselves gave them the thumbs up of approval, so... That alone applies that Sega had future plans for these characters. Remember Sonic Spinball? There was a bonus level where you could play as Princess Sally, Bunny, Antoine, Rotor, from the... Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you, you could actually free them in a bonus stage from a uh, roboticizer type level. It was like a bonus level in the pinball game. I haven't played that in so long, so I apologize if I'm a little out of air. <laughs> but, um, anyway... There, there was also this controversy in 1997 relating to the whole Sadiem issue going on with Archie Comics, and they planned to kill off Princess Sally, and in an interesting twist of events, Sega implored them not to do it. And I don't know, it, it's bewildering how Sadiem has maintained an esoteric success over 15 years, yet Sega fails to utilize the characters and settings in any of their games. I mean, of course, excluding Sonic Spinball. But, you know, the show, the show itself, I mean, it involves characters that you could relate and sympathize with. Well, it expounds on a game that was virtually about a hedgehog that ran and fought robots. The show is genius. The creators took something simplified and, and stretched it out. The overall tone just paints this dark Orwellian atmosphere portrayed in that classic 1930s format. And it's just no surprise that the inspiration was derived from sci-fi opuses such as Star Wars and Blade Runner, and it was done in a brilliant fashion. But sadly, it just seems like Sega is sitting on a gold mine here, and they just haven't dug for it. So that's my take on it. <laughs> this almost could have been a decent little opinion piece video, something which I think most people who like the show would agree with. But instead, Kuda yet again fumbles and makes this, I'll be honest, extremely funny, slightly creepy, and a little bonkers video where he pretends to be interviewed. Considering everything that was going on during this time, all this really does is adds a strange sense of ominous, slightly narcissistic, as I've kind of alluded to before, and above all else, sadness to this whole situation. But I think I've teased it long enough. How about that Sonic fan movie, huh? Well, Kuda would end up releasing a teaser for it, which showcased the following. Not exactly the best thing I've ever seen, but for a fan film standard, it's actually pretty good. Though it seems a lot of the shots were made for the teaser itself, which isn't exactly a good sign when you already have so much work to do when putting together an hour and a half film. 
But all the same, this would be, for the first time, something tangible that Kuda could share around once again. So after this, Rich would then open up an Indiegogo campaign to help fund his fan movie, and perhaps get it done once and for all, being able to use the money to hire animators and the like for his project. Of course, many were pretty skeptical about Kuda actually being able to get this done, and from the get-go, accused him of ripping people off, or that his campaign would go nowhere, or that this project would be shut down by Sega, and technically, what he's doing is illegal, etc, etc, etc. While all this drama was going on, a sudden tragedy would strike, one that for once had nothing to do with Rich. On August 31st, 2010, the Sonic fandom learned that Ben Hurst, chief writer for season 2 of Saturday M Sonic Cartoon, the man who many looked up to and saw as the genius behind the show, the one who was always eager to engage with the community and answer fan questions, a truly excellent writer, passed away. He was only 59 years old. For many, this marked an end of an era, as well as any sort of hope for a real Sonic Saturday M Season 3. Indeed, the show truly did die alongside Ben. Many took the time to pay their respects online, a memorial being made on the FUS website, citing people's admiration for the man who touched their lives through his writing. This was also a time when many reflected upon the past few years of their life, that maybe it was okay that the show never would continue on. Maybe it's better to just remain a happy memory. A show that brought them all together. Maybe it was truly time to grow up and let go. But Richard Kuda, well, Rich felt different. Once again, Rich was faced with a choice to let go and move on to allow Ben's death to be the final note on his journey, or to carry forward full speed ahead, letting the tragedy fuel his blind passion all the more, despite seemingly no one wanting or caring about his project by this point, to plunge oneself yet further into the black void. Rich, once again, shows the latter. Quote, I know Ben Hurst was never much of a big time celebrity, but this really affected me when I heard the news. He was a creative inspiration to me, and I'll never forget the conversations we had spanning from 1998 to 2008. I recall when he announced his plans of developing a season 3 movie, and how Sega rejected it. When I initiated contact with him, I was only 18 years old and expressed empathetic support of his efforts. He even gave me advice on how to be a success and what approaches to take for future projects. Then throughout college, the idea sparked of a Sonic movie and that continuing ambition has never fizzled out. He was there to guide me like a wise old sage and now that he's departed from us, the motivation in me is more so fueled in accomplishing the goals that he left unfinished. This is why I'm announcing that my fan film will be dedicated to the memory of the man that gave us old school Sonic fans a reason to support this dying franchise. Unquote. In response, a user by the name of Gray responded with the following. A not whole resident. This is in bad taste. It's like you're using the man's death to advertise your fan movie. This is something that you put at the beginning or the ending of a completed movie, not on a donation page. At least to me, this just feels wrong. Unquote. To which Rich responded with the following. Quote, you have no idea how much his death personally affected me. Not just because of Sonic, but of directing me in the right career path. Not only that, but he is the very reason I even started this Sonic movie. I remember back in 2005 when I contacted him about possibly helping me pitch this to Sega. He politely passed on it and told me good luck. Even before then, I contacted him in 1998 when I was at a crossroads of what I wanted to do after high school. His interview on Sonic HQ regarding his Sonic movie inspired me, which led me to my initial contact with him. At that time, 
I was like a fanboy and asked him how I can achieve such greatness as him. He suggested about attending an art college and taking courses relating to animation, creative writing and such. I remember how excited I was when I told him that I graduated with a BFA degree. He was my support throughout college and I can't really imagine what my life would have been if I didn't take his advice. It's almost like having a father figure that I always wanted because my douchebag of a father never supported any of my ambitions. Probably would have been at some low-end junior college stuck taking general ed classes and mediocre art courses. As you can see, you can probably understand why I feel it's appropriate to dedicate this film in his honor." Unquote. Now, in retrospect, there are two ways you can read these messages. Rich was being honest and earnest in wanting his fan film to be in dedication to Ben Hurst, since regardless it's obvious based on Rich's obsession with this show that he was a very important man to him. Or you can read this as nothing more than a man trying to use a great man's death to boost up his own fan projects. Or you could see it as a combination of both, but either way, this was without a doubt a bit tone deaf. Not only to the fact that people are only just finding this info out that morning, but also I'm not sure if Kuda really understood how little respect or care anyone in this community had for him or his project at this point. Even if he was being 100% genuine, which I'm inclined to believe just because why would someone dedicate this much fucking time to this kind of project if they didn't look up and care about its creator. All this really does is leave a further bad taste in everyone's mouth when the majority already think you taste like shit and runs the risk of alienating even more people. I do believe these messages had good intentions within them. But once again, when you're dealing with a community that doesn't like you, doesn't respect you, and has several reasons for why that could be the case, Every single message, whether it be with good intentions or not, will be interpreted the worst way possible. In this case, most believing Richard Cooter to be a cold and cynical man who's using the death of Ben Hurst as a means of propping up his own fan film. To top things off, guess what else was happening around this time? Step back and imagine this. A perfect world. A place where you can just kick back, just enjoy everything around you. Freedom. Then imagine seeing all that taken away because one bloated Eggman wanted it all. I'll tell you everything. How it got this way and how I'm gonna make sure it goes back. It's go time! Yep, another Sonic fan film project, starring none other than Jaleel White as Sonic, just like from the show. Oh, and Doug Walker and James Rolfe, I guess. It's a short film that actually ended up being finished, and while it's not exactly great, or even that good by any means, it's, it's alright for what it is, I suppose. However, at the time, Rich was absolutely beyond pissed, and rather jealous that this other guy came in and managed to get Jaleel White on board for his fan film. Well, in the meantime, when Kuda tried to contact Jaleel White, he never contacted him back. When Kuda tries to make a Sonic Sat AM fan film, everyone mocked him. Everyone laughed at him. And his reputation online, through it, was completely destroyed. Whereas this guy comes in, is able to get Jaleel White, announces his plans for a Sonic fan film, got several internet celebrities on board, and everyone is more than willing to help in his project. Perhaps in some rightful sense, Kuda complained about this online, with many mocking him for it, but ultimately it was all just sort of sour grapes and hurt feelings. Oh, and did I mention that this was all happening DURING Kuda's Indiegogo campaign? So it was just terrible. 
terrible timing all around. In fact, I'm not so sure Kuda's morale could have been any lower than it was by that point. And so, Rich's Indiegogo campaign was a failure, only mustering up 300 bucks by its end. However, Rich, as always, was still determined, and so he used the 300 to hire some animators, supposedly from Linternia Magica, a studio in Argentina responsible for Los Pintin al Resacarte, and various small projects contracted by Disney, Filmax, and Patagonic, to create the following clip in 2011. The fear in your eyes indicates weakness. And if I may quote Charles Darwin, the weak is preyed upon by the strong. Terminate him! Sonic! No, Tails. Get out of here, guys. Sonic, you can't be serious. He's too much of a match for you to fight alone. Now! Come on, Tails! about to get messy in there. This would be the first real scene of Kuda's project. The first time all of his thoughts and ideas would be something actually viewable. And so too would it be the last. Speaking personally, while the animation is very rough, the dialogue is stiff and at times it's kind of awful. And that one shot of them zooming in on Metal Sonic's eyes and you see all the pixels is just appalling. It's also not the worst thing I've ever seen either though. And again, for a fan project, it certainly has potential, especially as sort of a proof of concept. But potential is nothing without results. And a fan project is nothing without fans to actually support it. And as you might imagine, this piece of animation was but one more thing to laugh at Richard Kuda over, with many noting how he wasted all the best years of his life all for this subpar animation clip, and others simply mocked Rich for every other piece of drama he had ever been associated with for the last few years, it all culminating into this. Bring your partner left and right, and make sure their diaper's nice and tight. Color them flat or color them shaded, doesn't really matter how the good lord made them. Richard Coop to throwing fits, sure glad I didn't ever go into this. Three hundred dollars all gone to waste, should've used it to get past first base. Now all we have is this piece of trash, I wouldn't even use it to wipe my ass. Come one, come all, gather all around, this here is the Metallic Hoedown. Richard Kuda had made a short piece of animation, but at what cost? Was any of it ever worth it? If Rich was truly a blind fool running through the dark till now, seeing the reactions of all those who I believe he hoped to convince of his work through this clip to finally get some recognition for all his hard work, only to laugh and mock him more and more after everything must have been a breaking point. This was his ultimate failure. He followed that road that so often gave him options to get off of it. The road to nowhere led to its logical conclusion. And now, he found himself at a dead end. With no way back, and nothing ahead of him, but the black hole he pushed himself into. This was defeat and of more than just his passion project, but also of his reputation, and more than anything else, of him self. What ultimately put a stop to that fan project? Logistically speaking, it was a lack of funding. Because despite the backlash and negative reception from just the trailers and the horrible voice acting, I still would have pressed on, even if I had the finances to do so. But with any project, money is almost primarily the roadblock. But I'd say it was a blessing in disguise, because years after it was canned, 
I realized how poorly written the script was, so I probably dodged a bullet by pulling the plug prematurely, because I can't imagine investing another five or so years on what would essentially be an embarrassing piece of sonic media, so maybe the universe spared me that moment. <laughs> Richard Kuda failed, not because of how well or not animated this short was. He failed because he made all the wrong choices along the way. He made a public ass of himself, pinned the blame of his mistakes onto others, presented far, far, far too much of himself online, and most of all, never learned from his mistakes, and thus repeated them time and time again. Richard Kuda had become a lolcow because he was predictable and others took notice when he never cared to, and others laughed when he chose to carry on, and others shunned him when he chose to keep coming back to a bridge that was burned 20 times over. But in the end, he didn't really hurt anyone. Nah, anyone but himself. As by now any friends he had were long gone, and the enemies he had had material to ruin his life forever at this point, and anyone who maybe once had faith in his projects no longer cared or lost faith in him by now. Rich was all alone, the dark pit of the internet, having swallowed him fully at last. His legacy to be a laughingstock for others and nothing more. And so, that was how our story had ended for a while. After the failure of the Sonic fan film, Richard left the public eye for several years, only lurking around from time to time. But no other major drama or craziness stemmed from him. That is, until around 2015 or so, when Kuda started showing up a bit more often online. Or perhaps people simply started taking notice of him again. Though this time it would be away from forums and the like, and instead of his own social media accounts, both old and new. For those who have read through Kuda's old ED page, or followed him back in the day for one reason or another, this is where our story takes a turn into the modern era. For that reason, I'm going to start off by showcasing his new YouTube channel first, and what it consists of currently. Kuda's new YouTube channel, titled Rich Monk, is an interesting hodgepodge of old art projects, childhood memories, indie music, and of course, Sonic the Hedgehog. Here you can watch his fan movie trailer and preview to this day, several stop motion animatic film stuff from the mid to late 2000s. Do 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 do. Oh yeah, cause I kick ass. Mm hmm. Yoink. I think I'll step outside to enjoy my daily caffeine intake. Do 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 do. Oh sure. <laughs> This happened. Why the fuck is this thing chasing me? Ah! <laughs> uh, after him, men. Rich, Rich, you gotta help me. What the fuck? Ah, holy crap! I uh, got you now. Hey, what are you doing? You die now. Phew, that was a close oh, one. Oh yeah, cause I kick ass. A one in particular I found interesting was Game Boy 2007, which was apparently a skit Rich acted out for the short-lived Retro Rich show. <laughs> yes! Gotcha now! Woo! Alright! Money, fire, blower, save my ass again. 
You want some of this, Koopa Stupas? I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? Proving that I'm an undisputed video game champion of the world. What else? Okay, well, don't you have a show to do? Yeah, but that's not for a while. Relax, man, it's July. Ooh, boss time! Um, FYI, it's actually September, and you've been playing that green screen white brick thing for three months now. Oh my god. You're right! How much time do we have? Um, it's a risk I'm willing to take. Wish me luck. Who the hell still plays Game Boy? I'm selling this thing on your eBay. Could you imagine? We almost had another classic YouTuber game reviewer documentary on this channel. But actually, funnily enough, according to the description of this series, or maybe even just this single video, came out on a website called Operator 11, which up until now I had literally no clue what that was. But I guess the short answer is it was a place to upload videos like so many that died out to the great titan that is YouTube. Amongst these early videos, you also have this video titled Drowning Simulation 2, of which there used to be a Drowning Simulation 1. Ominous. Around August of 2013, Rich would try and create a new series for this channel called Audio Files, where he reviewed new albums by the bands he liked as they came out. Which is an interesting thing to note, as it, uh, one of the few things I have yet to really bring up to this point in this video outside of that one Weezer Nation bit, is that Richard is a humongous fan of indie slash alternative music of the time. And in fact, a lot of his work, you know, like his paid work, came from creating album covers, posters, and all sorts of creative stuff for the indie scene out in California. This album just came out and it's already receiving a bunch of polarizing reviews, and quite frankly, I'm no exception. However, all the same, this series was short-lived. But it actually wasn't too bad. I mean, every episode is pretty short and simple, although I will admit that it feels like a show that was certainly aimed at people more familiar with the music scene of the time, which I'm just not. But of all the things Kuda has created, I feel like he's in a very natural state here talking about this stuff. However, according to Rich, he had to stop this series because he was feeling burnt out. And at the time, he was working a full-time job for Oracle, which he ended up working for for around seven years. And so anything creative was sort of on the back burner, or just the occasional thing during this period. Besides that, you then have stuff like Richard singing alongside the band Every Moves a Picture's song, Signs of Love.
or rich bouncing a ball around. No, seriously, how am I going to get that the fuck out of there? A rich snowboarding. Or Rich just, just chilling out for two minutes. Well, lie, I keep expecting him to light a cigarette with this footage. Oh, and how could I forget this cinematic masterpiece that I'm sure you remember me using for the title card. Then we get some more interesting things like Rich retelling moments from his childhood in this little series he made called Memories. Some of which has actual footage of him as a kid playing with his siblings, or his Nintendo console, etc. So one time, my friends and I kind of dared each other to jump on the opposite side of the monkey bars. If you gotta visualize that, basically you're like a couple feet suspended off the ground, and there's like two parts of it. You have the sidebars, and then you have the ladder itself that you swing across. We were trying to jump on the actual side, like the right part of it, so what we did is we climbed on the tallest part of the structure and we would just lunge out as far as we could and try to jump on there and latch on. It was a very scorching day outside. People were getting sweaty. So of course, naturally, when I made the attempt, I did make it, but my hand slipped, but the momentum of my, uh, of my feet kicked over my head and I did like a triple flip in the air and I landed on my arm, shattering it in two places. Jake must feel it! <laughs> 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 Some of them got in there because you already. Yeah, I didn't know I went to the bathroom. Yeah, and I think... Say hi for the camera, Darren. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> parents. The parents. Get Tristan. And he's in there too? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, who's going to start? Who? Wow, Rick, did you finally get it? I finally did. Why are you ripping the box up? Because it's stuck. Ugh. Rick, don't rip it apart. Boy, did you ever see a kid? Oh, good, Rick. Don't worry, it will work. But I'm sure you're all wondering, where the hell is the Sonic stuff? Well, Rich also has a few videos where he shows off his new toys of his favorite Sadie M characters. You know, Santa, you're 25 years late, but you know what? I forgive you. Oh my god, these are so fucking badass. 
Look at the detail on these. Isn't that incredible? It's almost show accurate to every proportion. I'm just gonna let you guys soak this in because this is just incredible. Never in my life did I think I would ever see sad AM figures Soak it in. And look at the fine craftsmanship. I'm just gonna diligently rotate them here so you can see every angle. I mean, look at that. They even have their little stands and everything. Well, for 25 years, this is what I've always wanted, especially as a Sat AM Sonic fan. Oh, sorry, Tails. I didn't mean to knock you out of the spotlight. Keep you stand. Why are you standing? Oh, damn it. Uh, okay, I'll figure something out. But anyway, guys, yes, these are genuine Sally Acorn and Bunny Rabot figurines. I mean, if I could actually get a little bit closer here, you could see all the fine detail that was incorporated into it. Look at that. Nicole looks exactly how she did in the show. Oh, my God. I mean, I feel like... I'm in a fantasy world right now because this is what I've been dreaming about since I was a kid. And the fact that somebody out there made this long awaited dream of mine come true is just nothing short of a miracle. Man, it's so, so surreal to me that I'm actually in possession of something this pristine, this, this accurate. The fact that Sega has squandered 25 years of this opportunity to make Sat AM Archie toys or figures or collectibles of some sort. And once again, the fans come to the rescue. Oh my God. I am gonna cherish these like my own kids. All right guys, uh, Merry Christmas. Thanks, sugar. Ow! Oh, my stars. I'm just falling apart. Let's see who's at the door. Oh! Oh! Is this who I think it is? It's my main man, Rotor! He finally arrived! <laughs> this makes number three. Yes, I can't believe after all these years, I'm getting more and more of my favorite Sonic characters in plush form. Oh, he looks fantastic. Look at the stitching, look at the detail on that. Oh my God, it's so accurate. I love it. Backwards hat and everything. Chill in 90s style. Yep, Rotor Walrus, he's here. You drop this. <gasps> Nicole? Rich is uh, pretty happy to get these, as you can see. He is, after all, a pretty big fan of Sally Acorn, something which is an interesting note for things to come. Amongst these videos are also Rich's reactions toward the actual official Sonic movie that came out. Yeah, as a guy who worked so damn hard to try to get his movie made, you might imagine that this caught his interest and might have stung maybe just a little. But I do suppose it had been so many years ago at this point. All right, guys, the moment of truth. I heard that the poster was displayed here, so... Oh my God, there it is. This is real, guys. This is happening. This is, uh... 
Yeah, it's Sonic the Hedgehog movie poster. It's real, it's not photoshopped, it's not a meme. This is legit. Paramount is very serious about this apparently. And um, I've waited 25 years for a Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Not exactly what I anticipated. It's gonna be a very interesting 2019. I'm gonna go cry. Almost everybody hated the original Sonic movie design. It was so bad that it went outside the sphere of Sonic fans mocking it and became an online joke for all. This would, of course, lead to the film being delayed and a fresh redesign for Sonic that to be more faithful that almost everyone thought was way better, Rich included. Amazing what one year could do. There's also some videos that have been taken down since, well, I started making this documentary. Videos of what appears to be Kuda dressed up in cosplay as Sally Acorn and sneaking around. Now, outside of YouTube, Kuda was also quite active on Twitter, as well as several other social media platforms, something which others took note of. The others this time being the internet gossip forum, Kiwi Farms. Nowadays, not many people get new Encyclopedia Dramatica pages. Hell, the site is only half running most of the fucking time. But in many ways, I'd say Kiwi Farms has become the new outlet for those interested in strange and interesting individuals. Be you a simple lurker reading through others' discoveries and all the drama, or an active participant in the conversation and often ridicule of said individuals. All the same, for someone to have an act of Kiwi Farms thread, you gotta be doing something worth talking about. And while Kuda's thread is nowhere near active as in the last six or so years, it's really only had 19 pages, which is pedestrian compared to some of the titans of the website. And even then, a fair bit of it is just going back over information that was first introduced on Kuda's original ED page. Also note that there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Richard Kuda is a alpha. Well, this seems to have been added on as a joke slash insult slash I guess just a blatant lie. That who is Kiwi Farms Threads title, but it's also a very serious accusation and not exactly something that I would personally joke about. So again, I wanted to make it clear that nothing of that sort is going to be brought up during the course of the rest of this video. And frankly, I think it gives the wrong impression of who Richard Kuda is for anyone who looks him up and finds his Kiwi Farms thread. Richard Kuda has done a lot of cringy, crazy ass shit across the internet over the last well over 10 years. Being a is not at all one of them though. That said, what new stuff can be found here? Well, to start, the thread opens on December 23rd of 2015, at which time, Kuda had a Tumblr account and a YouTube account called I Side Tape. Now both of these accounts have since been deleted, so a lot of info and original context seems to have been all but lost to time, with only forum user summaries to go by. It seems Kuda's Tumblr was used as a sort of personal journal, Kuda giving his thoughts on various topics, such as his past relationships, his viewpoints on sex, as well as his sex-related stories, uh, prostitutes, and of course, diapers. Again, I unfortunately cannot read what these messages said in full, so I don't really know 
much about them outside of their headers, I suppose. Another topic that was brought up by the OP of the thread, Ichigo Peron, is that they used to work together with Takuda's other trolls back in the day, and two of them went by the online handles Snake and Sega Kool-Aid. The latter being a joke, if you'll remember earlier, about when Kuda said that Sonic fans who don't criticize Sega are drinking the blue Kool-Aid. I would tell you more about these two individuals, but I don't admittingly know that much about them, and nothing was really well documented, and according to Ichigo Peron, Snake committed you-know-what to himself, and Sega Kool-Aid was apparently incarcerated on conviction of a DUI manslaughter. Fucking yikes. Meanwhile, on the YouTube channel, it seems Kuda was using the Eyeside Tape channel to post his ABDL and other diaper shenanigans videos. And again, these videos and the channel are lost to time, so only the forum user's descriptions are there. It seems none of them took the effort to document anything, at least to my knowledge. So, moving on. Another discovery in the thread is that Kuda has had quite the history of posting adult baby diaper related offers on Craigslist, with the first example being about 10 years ago. Quote, the year is almost over, and I still find myself single and frustrated. With that said, I'll be upfront. I've been active in the ABDL, Adult Baby Diaper Love, community for over a decade, and even embraced the lifestyle that has been adapted into my identity. Basically, I'm seeking an ABDL girlfriend, aka Little. I have no idea what that means, by the way. A woman that's into regression and diapers. Open-minded, quirky, playful, affectionate. Within the age range of 25 to 35, and lives anywhere within the SF Bay area. As you can see in my profile pics, I have the appropriate accommodations, since my apartment is a giant nursery, as that contains a queen-size crib, large play area, lots of toys, and plenty of diapers. With that said, let's get a conversation going and see what develops. Hopefully we can start 2016 on a positive note, since this year has been extremely lonely with nobody to play with. When responding, please put Huggies in the subject line." Unquote. I'll uh, spare you reading them all, but there's a few posts like that that all are kind of just Kuda advertising the same exact thing. There's even an occasion where he got somebody the bite, uh, but since Kuda is half naked in a diaper in those pictures, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna show those. But eventually, Kuda himself found out about the form thread and again responded to it through his I side tape Tumblr page. Once again, we can't read it. However, another topic that is brought up a fair bit in Kuda's Kiwi Farm thread is Kuda's politics, his stance on voting, etc. I won't read it all, since it's mostly Facebook politics rants, but the TLDR is he thought voting for Romney or Obama was the lesser of two evils, then randomly changed his mind later on when, quote, Romney lost and that's all that matters, common sense prevails over religion, you know, whatever that's supposed to mean. Also, when Trump won in 2016, let's just say Kuda was not very happy about it, uh, to say the least. And it actually almost got him fired at a job over the whole fucking ordeal. Later on, users started to copy and paste his Q&A stuff from iSide Tape, which, might I add, seems to have been full of both very personal questions and even more personal answers. Later, in late 2016, YouTuber Pan Pizza, aka Rebel Taxi, had Kuda on as a guest for his Pizza Party podcast. The podcast was made during the time when Kuda was still going by iSide Tape, and notably, he describes his YouTube channel at the time as making ABDL comedy skits and stuff to make other ABDL community members feel comfortable doing what they're doing. And then later on in the conversation goes into more Sonic related topics and Kuda's general backstory online. Skipping ahead, by a lot, there isn't really much else that happens in this thread besides Kuda posting more personal videos, including ones about his issues with his father and other such things that once again are lost to time. 
He continues the diaper video posting and generally giving people more of a reason to keep posting about him for some time. Notably, his diaper skits where he would go out in public in baby attire, which many found to be, well, uh, cringy and uh, a little bit creepy to say the least. This continued until eventually something happened and Kuda was notified that he would have to leave his then apartment. In response, he did a live stream talking about how he might be homeless for a while and that he's gonna have to get rid of all his ABDL related stuff. Hey guys, um, I know this is kind of last minute since I haven't really made any announcements for this stream or any of the previous ones for that matter, but um, this is kind of an important one that I'm really reluctant e to even do since um, there's a lot of personal shit that I'm going through right now and I don't want to get into it until more people kind of file in since it's, it's basically life altering and I didn't think that Anything like this could happen so suddenly like this. You, you feel that, you know, you, you pursue in your goals, you overcome obstacles, but then the world just constantly shits on you. And the ultimate, the, uh, it's just like the ultimate shit blast basically is what happened to me today. And I'm really, I'm really fucking devastated about how just this all fell apart in a matter of, of hours, basically. I'm being evicted from my apartment, and they're not giving me any reason why. And on top of that, I was laid off from my job, since they told me that it was seasonal and they didn't need me anymore. So it just kept adding on the pile there. So what I'm trying to say, guys, is... I need to find a place to live within 30 days. I can't afford to do it since I'm not working now. And the cost of moving in my situation is going to be more than what's in my bank account right now. So I really hate to do this to you guys, but I'm going to create a PayPal donation link. And if anybody contrib can contribute anything, I I'd really appreciate it. My parents and my friends, they're not helping me. I, I have no idea who to turn to. If anybody in the chat wants to, wants to say anything, or at least give me some type of advice, I, I'd really appreciate it about now, because I'm kind of losing hope in everything at this point. You don't think you, you could wake up one day and you receive a phone call that you're laid off from your job, and then you get a knock on your door like an hour and a half later, and it's your landlord handing you an eviction notice. This fucking bullshit right here. And the thing that really infuriates me is the fact that they're not telling me why they're evicting me. They kept saying, oh, it's confidential. We can't disclose that bullshit. I have paid my rent on time. I have never been delinquent with any of my payments, I've been a good tenant, I haven't caused any type of conflict with anybody, I got along with my neighbors, so I don't know what the fuck's going on. And yeah, I do have an estimate. Because the cheapest housing is around $1,100, so count that, and the security pot, the deposit, which is $1,500, and then I gotta pay my remaining rent at my current apartment, which is $2,500, so I need roughly five grand just to fucking move, even if it's to the cheapest fucking place. I really appreciate that. I'm selling everything. My ABD life, my ABD lifestyle is officially, it's over. I'm gonna have to sell the crib. I'm gonna have to sell a lot of my toys, all the clothing, and the diapers. They're all gonna go. They're all gonna fucking go. <laughs> God damn it. I'm really trying to get myself together because when, you're, when your life is practically in shambles, 
when you're going to be living on the street, when you're going to be begging for any type of job, you don't know what to do. I did speak to my landlord. I had a two hour conversation with her and she's just the most inconsiderate, bitchy person I have ever spoken to. She actually doesn't give a fuck about my situation. She just says, I'm, I need to find a place within 30 days and they're gonna penalize me if I, if I don't. I mean, there's no such thing as sympathy anymore. It's just like these greedy motherfuckers. He did end up finding a different place to live, but the damage was already done. I think the whole situation might have been a bit of a wake-up call for Kuda, as shortly after that, Kuda decided to delete all his diaper skits, all of his eye side tape stuff, a complete nuking of it all. This would appear to be the last time Kuda made the diaper stuff his defining trait online, which was an obvious far cry from the days of old when he seemed rather ashamed of it all. Into the eyesight tape era of full embrace, onto, well, the era of now where Kuda seems to want to distance himself from his past and hold some deep regrets over posting so many pictures and videos of himself in this rugrat attire. To say Kuda made a mistake posting this stuff online would be an understatement. Perhaps the understatement of his life. I don't pretend to understand his diaper wearing lifestyle, nor do I really care to, but surely these activities, these things could be done and kept in private, yes? So much of Richard Kuda's life has been ruined by him posting pictures of himself online for all to see in such a state, for sharing far too much of himself for everyone to look at. It happened back when he was trying to make a film, and then once more, when it caught the attention of the people over at Kiwi Farms. It would be one thing if he didn't care about what others thought of him, but I think it seems pretty clear by now that he indeed does care about that. So it's all quite befuddling. That said, there is yet another facet of Kuda's online presence, that being his then Twitter account, and after he deleted all the eyesight tape stuff, this seemed to be his new outlet for, um, stuff. Quote, me. Sally, is there a reason why you always shove your ass in my face? I didn't say stop. The American people are the freedom fighters, and we need to take down Dr. Trump Botnik and finally end his reign of greed, malice, and tyranny. Sally, farts loudly. Chipmunk emoji. Me, shut the fucking door, are you kidding me? Mina, laughing cry emoji. Nicole, uh, squinty, annoyed emoji. Ah yes, the infamous pinup circa 1995. Can't tell you how many times I masturbated to this in junior high, smiley face emoji, chipmunk <laughs> emoji. <laughs> Nuthole is my background, chipmunk emoji. So we've been stuck indoors for three weeks now, longer for others, and as an hashtag ABDL, I want to use this opportunity to connect with other diaper dwellers. So if you're over 18, post in the comments where you're from and how long you've been at the diapers. Let's make new friends. Shades emoji. And uh, below is a picture of him in a diaper with a, with a toy. LOL designed this two years ago. Hashtag ABDL. Diapers. Less horrifying than this. Apparently. So, yeah, Kuda had this whole thing where he seemed to be role playing as his Sonic OC of the time, Rich Monk, and his interesting relationship with Sally Acorn and the other Archie slash Sadie M Sonic cartoon related characters. He also had a whole backstory for this roleplay that he created over on his DeviantArt page uh, based on the fact that Sally Acorn was now being left behind by Sega, or I guess in some sort of major sense was for such a long time, and now with Archie Comics having fallen apart and coming to an end, that essentially just made it so Sally Acorn was not going to be in any kind of media at this point, possibly ever again. Thusly, Richie Kuda made it so she wasn't just abandoned by Sega and Archie and the like, but she was also dumped by Sonic the Hedgehog himself. Forgotten and left behind. I suppose in much the same way, like the Sonic fanbase had cast Kuda aside, and thus started the loving and 
frankly, fucking weird relationship of Rich Monk and Sally Acorn. This was about the time I began to set the work in motion for the Richard Kuda documentary, or the Kudamentary, if you will. And eventually found myself interviewing Richard Kuda himself after he had heard through the grapevine that I had plans to create this video. That way I can ask the pressing questions like, so, what was up with being in a relationship with Sally Acorn on Twitter? <laughs> oh boy, we're getting into the nitty gritty. Um, okay, so I'll be upfront. I've always had a crush on her, like from junior high and onward. She just represented the perfect girl to me growing up, but I think that's based on my own insecurities regarding women, but Anyway, Sadiem's 25th anniversary was approaching since this was like the fall of 2018 and initially I wanted to do something to celebrate this momentous occasion. So after several years, it brought me back into making Sonic fan art again, which I produced several posters and um, basically it helped convey my love of the series, which are available on my personal site and my DeviantArt gallery. So. This kind of rekindled my interest in Sat AM. Um, it had me a bit nostalgic for the days of when I was actively involved in the community because after the fan film debacle, I left the community in early 2011 and focused my energy on other things. And that disconnect really helped me put perspective on my life and how I was basically squandering my time in the Sonic community in general. So, while I was producing all this fun sat AM art back in 2018, I started a little role play on Twitter to create this believable narrative of the Freedom Fighters interacting with my chipmunk OC. And it somehow gained attention to where I took the role play in a different direction and it primarily focused on my growing relationship with Sally. And the justification for this is that Archie recently canceled uh, the comic book. And they announced that Sonic wasn't allowed to be in a relationship anymore with this upcoming IDW deal. And I played around with that and created this backstory of how Sonic and Sally went through a horrible breakup to where Sonic not really left Sally, but also the Freedom Fighters. So in other words, Sonic is an asshole in this in this story. <laughs> but um, I noticed the attention my role plays were getting, mostly negative, and I used that to my advantage because after all the years of the Sonic fan base abusing me, it was now my turn to retaliate, and the best way I could was to troll. <laughs> so the innocent story of Sally and I building a relationship became more sexually exaggerated, where she started to experiment and act goofy and stupid and all that. And believe it or not, I based her new personality on real life experiences I've, I've had with women, because, you know, they're not all sunshine and butterflies. <laughs> I should know, because I have an older sister, and I'm sure anyone who has a sister can relate. Um, they'll announce when they fart, make crazy hypotheticals regarding dares, have their little awkward moments in public. It's why Sally acted out of character. She, she was no longer tethered to Sega or Archie, and my OC was basically teaching her how to cut loose and be more playful. So it's cute, but in a strange way, it was also my way of living vicariously through my childhood fantasies. And I sincerely enjoyed tweeting these role plays because it, it simulated like having a second life. Th then it just completely went off the rails when, when me, Sally, Nicole, and fucking Mina Mongoose shared an apartment in downtown Mobotropolis and formed a band together. So, yeah, I think I had too much fun with that, but it is what it was, so I had my fun. <laughs> <laughs> Before I would end up interviewing Kuda though, he would appear on yet another podcast by the name of Club Spin, hosted by the then Sonic drama related YouTube channel, Dylan Thomas. The interview went quite well and honestly seemed like Kuda had sort of won the people in the podcast over. This, however, did not last for long, and while I won't go into all the nitty gritty details because 
frankly, it's uh, a rather insipid. The short version is there was an aftermath to this interview. You see, because everyone was so cordial and chill during the interview, Dylan's fan base apparently thought Dylan was now friends with Richard Kuda. And since Dylan used to make videos ripping in the locales and even in the Kuda himself, it seems that they did not approve of this. Or at least some of them didn't, and I, I don't know actually how large of a scale this outrage was. But either way, to save face, Dylan Thomas made his stance on Kuda crystal clear. Mind you, this statement came just after the interview, and was originally on Twitter, but of course has since been deleted. Quote, Okay, gonna say this now, cause I keep hearing people say that I like Richard Kuda. I'm on his side and a lot of other dumb shit. I do not like Kuda. Kuda is a diaper-loving retard. I've made fun of him in the past, and will make fun of him in the future. I am not his friend. I had Richard on my podcast, cause... Like it or not, he is important to the history of the Sonic fandom. I was nice to him when he was on the podcast, because I like to be able to have more guests on in the future. Something that will not happen if you roast them in the interview. Because I was nice to Kuda during our interview, I got to know a lot of info I want to know for years regarding his Sonic Sat AM revival project. I am going to have in in my comic as a joke. I will also put in Bloodshot, Cold Steel, and other memes too later. I was nice to him in that episode, just like I was nice to Sammy. It doesn't change how I feel about these people and their past shenanigans on the internet. You guys should really stop reading too deep into this shit. It's just an interview." Unquote. Richard, for obvious reasons, felt betrayed by this since, I mean, Dylan did just admit to using Kuda and pretending to be nice for him for the sake of views and information. Regardless of what you think of either of these individuals, this was what many might say to be a bit of a pointless cutthroat move, since I'm sure Dylan could have just ignored the comments about, I don't know, people who thought he was friends with Kuda and just moved on. It also just plain out doesn't make any sense because, I mean, if his goal was for more people to be coming on for the interview, um, wouldn't it make more sense to not publicly lambast them right after the interview? I mean, sure, you didn't do it during the interview, but if you did it directly after, I mean, isn't that kind of the same thing at the end of the day? Dylan Thomas would also go on to double and triple down to make several more videos mocking Richard afterwards. But I should note, recently, as in like the last couple weeks or so, Dylan Thomas actually completely left YouTube for now. He originally decided to change the focus of his channel to comics and stuff, taking down all of his Sonic drama YouTuber related content, uh, mainly because of all the drama he himself was in during that time. But then, you know, a bunch of people started making a ton of videos about him and, and mocking him and all the embarrassing incidents he had got himself into as of recently. I mean, he his Kiwi Farms thread is six times longer than Kuda's after all. But that's neither here or there. I just figured it was an interesting thing to note since Dylan Thomas will be brought up at least one more time uh, during the course of this video, but he is no longer making these types of videos anymore. In fact, I don't think he's making any type of video anymore. But all the same, Dylan Thomas's videos and all this drama shone a light down on Kuda yet again, bringing him quite a few new people to mock and shame him publicly. Thusly, Kuda decided to delete his then Twitter account and put a stop to the role playing as well. And after all this happened, Richard would once again go quiet online until we reach the final milestone of this story the storm that was Rally for Sally.
Now, this is quite a complicated bit of recent drama, so bear with me as I give you the rundown. So, the Rally for Sally movement, in short, was an effort to get the character of Sally Acorn into the Sega Hardlight developed mobile game, Sonic Dash. If you're not familiar with that game, you can kind of see what the gameplay is like for it on screen now. But, what's notable about it is that a lot of characters that were often considered forgotten, or at the very least very underused, were already getting to be playable characters in this Sonic Auto Runner. All as part of the constantly new and evolving content that was being added to the game. With that in mind, the stage was then set for fans to try and, well, rally behind this fan favorite character to get her into the game. But of course, it does run a tad bit deeper than that as it's more than just getting her into this mobile game, and in many ways would be the first stepping stone to this character of being acknowledged by Sega again, since many Satayam and Archie fans feel as though their favorite characters sort of get and have gotten left behind, with some even calling the characters non-canon, or saying that Sega doesn't own them, that Ken Penders does. Even though on several occasions, including again very recently, it has been confirmed by Ken Penders himself that he does not, in fact, own the Freedom Fighter characters from Sad AM, and that would include Sally Acorn. So this Rally for Sally movement was kind of a big deal for this part of the fan base. The whole thing was first conceptualized and ran by Alex Hedgefox, or in some places referred to as Nintendo Dude. And of course, this being a Sad AM related project, Rishikuda would eventually join in to help. This was, after all, a chance for more representation of the Archie slash Sadiem fanbase, which have been hungry for anything like that in the main franchise proper for 27 years, nearly three decades. There was also a bit of anger moving the movement, since Tangle and Whisper from the IDW published Sonic comics were announced to be new playable characters around that time of which were still very new and showcased a clear favoritism towards the new comics over the old ones. Now that said, Richard Kuda, even though for the most part he hadn't really been engaged in any um, meaningful way with the Sonic fandom for years at this point, still had a reputation to his name that still held with it a lot of controversy. And while the head people behind the movement knew Kuda was helping the project and had good intentions, to keep the uh, public perception clean of the movement, he simply went by the alias of Trent Dalton publicly to keep controversy away from the project. But also in Kuda's own words, as a means to surprise everyone later on, once he had contributed towards something a lot of people wanted. And maybe if he had succeeded in helping it come to fruition, then maybe others would see that he was a changed man. That his old failures and tales from the past don't define him anymore. Maybe even some people would warm up to him once more. This entire idea was, uh, well, well, we'll get to that. But anyway, the movement went on for some time, the campaign going off pretty well. All things considered, it even successfully got trending on Twitter. Kuda himself actually made several posters and the like for the movement and paid well into a thousand dollars to get some Sonic voice actors from Sad AM and the games and the like to voice their support for Sally Acorn as well, with Alex Hedgefox writing their scripts. Alright out there, you loathsome little peons. It is I, Dr. Robotnik. And as much as I despise those loathsome freedom fighters, I do miss the dear princess. And so I say unto you, rally for Sally, so that I may roboticize her. <laughs> Laugh with me. <laughs> That's enough. Hey, y'all. Just a little old rabbit here telling you that we need to rally for Sally. Now, she may be a tough cookie, but she needs a ladylike helping hand. So let's get in there and rally for Sally, huh? Hey, Sonic fans, this is Candy Milo giving a shout out to my dear, dear, dear friend, Chrissy Cavanaugh who is flying with the angels right now, and it sure would be great if you guys do a rally for Sally! Yeehaw! Yeah. 
the Princess Sally. I remember her. She was nice. She helped me out with those nice wolf people and found that onyx emerald thingy. Yep, she knows a lot. Like solving problems and so much more since she's smart and brave. So rally for Sally, guys, because everyone could use a great friend like her. Oh, and uh, have you seen my froggy? Princess Sally. What a diamond in the rough. <laughs> a strong-willed, pretty face to keep her teammates in check. Remind you of someone? <laughs> I've learned a lot from Sally, such as taking inspiration from her commanding demeanor of the Freedom Fighters and applying that to my position in the Resistance. So sure, I'll rally for Sally, and you guys should too, especially after her leadership during the Quantum Dial incident. That was quite the day. Never fear, Amy Rose is here to support one of my good friends, Sally Acorn. <laughs> what? Did you think otherwise? <laughs> Though it wasn't always that way, thanks to the Ring of Acorns, wishing on it allowed me to grow up fast so I can help Sally and the Freedom Fighters. We may have our disagreements, especially when it comes to Sonic, but we always manage to work things out. I've even taken inspiration from her in my position of communications operator in the resistance. So what are you all waiting for? Rally for Sally already. <laughs> no, seriously, do it. Whoa, it's juicing jam time. Let's do it to it. <laughs> What's up guys? This is a shout out to all the real Sonic fans out there and Freedom Fighters as a gift from Trent, Alex, and Koji. Thought you guys might want to hear from the OG Sonic saying what's up. Catching me in my dressing room right now shooting a little something for Fox. And uh, I got a little alert and my Sonic fans were looking for me. So that's what's up. Juice and jam time. <laughs> this was quite the bold and impressive move to get all these voices of the franchise on board like this. However, living in the background of all this was a fair bit of trouble for this movement, and Kuda, notably. As one of the other core members of the Rally for Sally movement, a guy who goes by the username of Kojiro Burchard, or just simply Koji, had been leaking info and DMs to AWF, or OFF, I guess, a guy who wasn't much of a fan of this movement, shall we say, and he was also leaking this same information to Dylan Thomas. Why was he leaking all this information, you might ask? Well, the answer to that is because Richard Kuda was involved with this project, and since Koji was one of the few people who was fully aware that Richard was a part of this movement, I guess he just thought it would be funny to leak the information about that to Dylan Thomas and trolls and the like. Uh, I'm not really sure what the exact motive was, but leaked it was all the same. This would lead to the both of them and others calling Kuda out on the official Sega Hardlight Discord server, posting pictures of him in his diapers, telling everyone about his past and generally putting a bad image on both him and by extension the Rally for Sally movement. From what I understand, there might have also been some exaggerations and just straight up lies about Richie Kuda, such as him being a what or something of the sort. Which would, of course, lead to Richard Kuda being kicked from the official Sega Hardlight Discord server, with this official statement being given to him. Quote, Hello, Rich Monk. This may be a bit sudden, but from several different sources, we have been pointed towards your social media history. After reviewing, we have found your online presence to be inappropriate and offensive. Therefore, we have decided to ban you from the Sega Hardlight server. I am happy to answer questions about this, but I would suggest being cautious to ensure your online identity doesn't tarnish your campaign." Unquote. Things are reaching a boiling point, and by Christmas, my goodness, Kuda has some really bad luck with Christmas time. Koji was once more goading AWF and leaking DMs, which would lead to the team kicking Koji off of the Rally for Sally project. But the damage was already done, as once more all the details about Kuda's involvement were leaked to Dylan Thomas, and things were getting harder to control. It would seem that despite Kuda's hopes, people were not willing to take his kind gestures. No matter what he does, there will always be those who want to expose his past, mock him, find ways to ruin whatever good faith he has with those around him. And by the end of the year, 
Kuda, it would seem, had had enough. The Sonic community that mocked him. The Sonic community members that helped in ensuring his creative projects failures. Community members who hired him to work alongside him, only to mock him and expose him once more from the darkness. And those community members who would and never will let his past die. It is immortal. Like a diaper full of so much shit super glued to his ass, there truly was no escape. It was foolish to think coming back and trying his hand at showing how much he had changed was ever going to go well. Like it or not, the internet never forgets your failures, your mistakes, your cringe. Even after over 10 years, Kuda's legacy would forever be the man who complained about Green-Eyed Sonic. The man who failed at making a Sonic movie, and the man who wears diapers. And so, Kuda officially revealed himself as the contributor to the Rally for Sally movement. But, since the cat was well out of the bag by now, and Kuda was all too aware that he wasn't going to be welcomed with any kind of warm embrace, Kuda added something extra. Actually, he added a lot extra. Over 10 years of frustrations, embarrassments, and very recent betrayals all led to Kuda writing a rant entitled The Chipmunk is No Longer Playing Chicken, in reference to his Trent Dalton Twitter account having a chicken character from the Archie comics as an avatar, but of course also as a statement that Richard had had enough and would no longer be hiding from the Sonic community, nor would he be hiding his opinions about them all either. Now, I won't read through all of it because it's a lot, and some of it is kind of stuff we already went over or is minor dramas that I didn't even cover here. For example, there's a whole section about how Kuda used someone's art without their permission, and there was this whole big fuss about how graphic designers aren't real artists and etc. It was all just kind of petty Twitter drama, basically. Which, I guess this is also that, but this was even more petty. Alongside uh, some of Kuda's complaints with the IDW Sonic comics, which people also take issue with because he doesn't like the IDW comics, I guess. The full rant will be in the description down below if you want to see it in full, however. But the following is the majority of the rant's major points. Quote, Just a preface. You're going to be here for a while, because there's a load of dirty laundry to air out. No doubt that 2020 was the year of devastation, but also self-reflection. I mean, a global pandemic essentially forced us to restructure our lives. And here in California, we also had to deal with rampaging forest fires that poisoned the air for two months. Feels like a coma-induced dream just even mentioning all of that. But world disasters aside, I also found 2020 to be the most productive I've ever been in terms of freelance gigs, leisure art, and group projects during quarantine. Under an alias, I was forced to go under due to my reputation. But the crux of this post is requesting for those who still unceasingly attack me over irrelevant matters that have been long resolved need to get over themselves constantly harassing me, spreading misinformation, and making idle threats like a high school bully over the most insignificant shit is just sociopathic. Time heals wounds and people can improve, but many toxic individuals refuse to let me. Hence, why I went incognito for almost a year to rebuild my name, mostly working with the hashtag Rally for Sally crew. Redemption apparently is frowned upon because you know, the Twitterverse can't thrive without drama. So allow me to finally set the record straight here. The massive contributions I've made with at Ralph for Sal last year is an example of the positive impact I've made with the Sonic community, as those positives outweigh the mistakes of the past. And if Sonic Twitter can take a page from that, then this place would be a little less dreadful. On the topic of Rally for Sally, there's a few things I must clarify since there are those who are spinning a narrative that is completely inaccurate. I was hired by at Gutter, aka Koji as the campaign's graphic designer and video editor in early last summer. Not only did I design the posters and produce the celebrity shoutout videos, but I later helped admin 
the Twitter account on a relatively frequent basis if other account users weren't available. But most notably, I paid all the voice actors, the ones who charged a fee, to assist with the campaign. $980 to be exact. Koji and the other Rally for Sally members can vouch for this. I literally have the receipts from all of these expenses. While this was a movement initiated by Alex and Koji, the truth is that I was responsible for 90% of it by my own volition, where I can lend my skills to something I enjoy that could also be appreciated by many. I was deeply passionate about this ambitious event when I originally heard about it and was willing to sacrifice my savings to make it thrive. I didn't have to spend an exuberant amount of money on this, but I wanted to. Considering that Sega Hardlight were extensively monitoring us since day one, it motivated me to put my best foot forward and ensure whatever work I was producing was top notch, yet also emulated their branding. So those denouncing my involvement is not only insulting, but further solidifies how these salty people are ready to dismiss any of my efforts because I'm the failed sat -AM movie guy, the Sonic 4 rank guy, the diaper guy, ammunition that's been used against me for over 10 years to jeopardize my integrity. Now, in less than three years, my youth will be entering a middle age. It's a frightening yet endearing stage in my life where I prefer to live the way I want without the fear and paranoia of being ridiculed for my harmless incentricities. But then there are those close-minded assholes who continue to blow them out of proportion to out me as a freak. There were times where I was unapologetically open about certain aspects of my life to where I was coerced into going public about it. This was around when someone leaked pics beyond my discretion in order to blackmail me from firing them from my Sonic fan film project I was developing after Sega of Japan rejected it as an official film in 2007. I thought the logical solution was to embrace it no matter what the reactions, instead of constantly being in denial. Denying it only exacerbated the issue you but it was a conflicting decision. No, he's talking about the diaper incident back um, on ED when he's talking about this. This was when I went through a brief phase of filming YouTube videos under the user iSide Tape 2013 to 2017 that in hindsight admittingly crossed the line of decency. They were filmed in an artsy avant-garde style that many found bewildering, including my subscribers. In other words, I was innocently self-aware but ignorantly playful about it. When I was filming at public parks, I informed the parents in advance to get their consent so I wouldn't end up in an uncomfortable situation, meaning no kids were present during shooting. Of course, these videos all backfired hard due to the questions they raised, which convinced me to close my YouTube and keep that stuff private, as I have for several years now. I have no control over who is circulating my old ABDL pics and videos, but all I can say in my defense is that I never harmed anyone, nor did they involve minors. Most of those commonly shared ABDL pics were taken at gatherings and parties with safe and restricted guidelines. Now people may feel uneasy from how my chipmunk character is portrayed on DeviantArt or for Affinity, but at the end of the day, it's all fair fantasy, and a very tame one at that. I honestly was never into porn and most of my pleasurable desires are PG-13 at best. And what's wrong with an artist having an imagination if it's not physically affecting myself or anyone else? And come on, if we're referring to Sonic fans, those sites are plastered with OCs and Sonic characters in much more disturbing settings. Lashing out at me of what's common in the Sonic fan base is hypocritical. In relation, there's an ABDL slash baby fur attached to this cancel camp who posts Sonic characters in diapers on the daily basis, yet has the audacity to call me disgusting. You see, what I find perplexing is that these losers enjoy forming hate mobs against others they despise and try to act like they're infallible. In recent weeks, I was dogpiled on just for adding background images to blank credit slash intro pages that IUW Comics was obviously too lazy to finish. But in the 2020s, apparently asking for effort from a company is considered demanding, and dispensing critique slash advice is harassment. It's really concerning that the bar has been lowered so far down to where any 
anyone who's genuinely motivated in improving someone's work is the villain now. What the fuck happened to standards in the last 10 years? Why are artists overly sensitive over the slightest opposing feedback? Why isn't talent being pushed to its limits anymore? Opposition creates discussion, which leads to improvement. It should be encouraged. This passive attitude makes me pessimistic for the future because this generation apparently prefers mediocrity. But that's a topic on its own. All I can say is that if you're not going to put effort into what you do, then you don't belong in a creative industry. And that motto stuck with me ever since my teachers and previous art directors have drilled that into my head throughout my schooling and career. Now, if you're a person who still wants to harshly judge me based on what happened a decade or so ago, then your priorities are twisted. I don't have the patience to deal with this type of immature and malicious conduct anymore. My focus right now is my career and dealing with what I can as the world remains paralyzed. And knowing that the usual suspects unleashed vicious methods of exposing me on Christmas is a cautionary tale of how toxic and mean-spirited the Sonic fanbase actually can be. I guess trolling someone on Christmas is more important than spending time with family? And I'm the creep here? I'm zooming with my family, watching movies, and all this shit is unfolding unbeknownst to me until I was messaged about it. I've even noticed petty tactics of people gathering old posts from over 5 to 10 years ago to pull this stunt on me again, as they did tried years back and their material can easily be confirmed as outdated since the Facebook and Twitter layouts don't match the current ones. Very deviously clever to pass off erroneous posts slash screenshots as current, I must say. This is what I like to refer to as the James Gunn maneuver. They're taking mostly outdated material and spinning the narrative to work in their agenda. It's cruel and manipulative, especially since said posts were either jokes or rant conversations that are being misconstrued and taken out of context. It's literally the typical move that SJWs are notorious of, and the very reason these mentally impaired goons shouldn't be taken seriously. Even more so, they're just recycling the same evidence that has been listed on my Encyclopedia Dramatica and Kiwi Farms page since the late 2000s. All the current evidence is so trivial it's laughable. I may have gotten into conversations resulting in disagreements and tense discussions, but even that is making a mountain out of a molehill. If this was a court case, it would be immediately dismissed from how ridiculous this all is. And since these people couldn't dig up fresh dirt, indicates how desperate they are to launch a pointless Twitter lynching on me. You might as well be tattling to the teacher like a virtue signaling little brat. And because of all the recent defamation and smearing of my name, certain reps at Sega Headlight, who initially knew me as my alias and was who I was working with, now have a soured impression of me. I've been making several attempts to sort it out for a while now, with the assistance of other R4S campaign members. Progress is still pending. I realize I'm infamous for many things in the Sonic fandom, which I've apologized for many times. But after years of affliction and enduring this ongoing abuse, then permit me to say, this cancel culture bullshit needs to stop. Nobody ever considers the consequences of their actions, as it can destroy someone's life socially and financially, as it almost did to me nearly 10 years ago, or even one year ago. It's like these people find a sick pleasure in watching someone suffer and have this morbid desire of never letting them succeed. They just drag them down to their level, because they have nothing better to do with their sad, pathetic lives. These hostile and investigative Sonic fans are the epitome of why this community can't have nice things by thinking with their emotions and not by their logic. I do something nice for the fan base during these turbulent times and this is the gratitude I get? Well thank you. Thank you for biting the hand that feeds. Now that I've come clean, I can proudly take credit for all the work I did last year's Rich, instead of an alias. You guys can claim that hiding my identity was wrong or that I lied about who I was, but after everything I've dispensed, I had every reason to do so. But overall, in the grand scheme of things, I've done nothing wrong to warrant an online witch hunt. If I'm able to better myself and to move on from my past, you can too. If you can't see value in someone's passion, talent, and positive intentions, then you need to check yourself. 
Holding on to old grudges when the person is no longer represents that era is reckless. So, why should I even bother reasoning with any of you? You're full-grown adults yet act like spastic five-year-olds, and your Twitter account should be revoked. You all act like perfect saints, pointing fingers, seeking out attention, policing the internet, when the majority of you are guilty of much worse atrocities than me, from what I've researched. I'm done with the drama. Period. That being said, I will not exhaust my energy debating, defending, or arguing the contents of this post. It's clear as crystal, and I've debunked these aforementioned accusations to the best of my ability. You can either accept it or not. Whatever you think, I don't care. Your validation is meaningless. So I hope I was able to emphasize how these socially inept rejects have crossed the line to where I had to practically chronicle every aspect of my troubled history. It's surreal to me that most of my mishaps stem from either being relentlessly provoked or associating myself with the wrong crowd. Unfortunately, it's mostly the latter, and I'm putting an end to it after nearly 15 years of torment. I'm a Sonic fan, a longtime fan, specifically Sad AM slash Archie fan, and I hope that never changes. However, disconnecting from all of this madness is becoming more compelling to me, because it's imperative that this fandom needs a crucial evaluation of how they treat others. All the backstabbing, betrayal, blackmail, over a damn speedy blue rat makes me wonder why this fanbase has been gradually depleting because no true fan would ever tolerate such malice and disrespect. Did that cut deep? I hope it did because putting this in perspective makes me realize how embarrassing this clown show you all call a community has been. There may be a global virus, but the toxic scumbags who fester here are a different kind of virus that needs to be eradicated from the fanbase. You guys poison the well and infect the kind-hearted. You deserve a fate more punishing than exile. Now for those who chose to comment slash respond to this post, either friends, enemies, etc., by all means, go nuts. Nobody is blocked or muted, so it's a free-for-all. I'll just be here observing the impending carnage from afar, since I will not be joining in. What's said is final and concrete. Now with all that off my chest, I leave you with a message of optimism. Let's finally beat this COVID shit once and for all. Please, let's do the right thing this year. Celebrate a hedgehog's milestone anniversary while we're at it. Last year was the disease. This year is the cure. The recovery has begun in 2021. Richard Kuda, aka Richmonk, unquote. The final result of this rant was him once again taking the spotlight. A few moments for the Sonic fanbase to all throw tomatoes at him. Videos made about his rant, people coming out to laugh and mock the man once more. Quote retweets, past dramas laid bare all again. It would seem, in his anger, Kuda had once again become the internet fool, the clown for the crowd. And while he was the one to respond to it all, it's clear this drama was not at all his fault. But instead, it would seem there were those who hungered for this exact result and got the exact drama they desired and then some. It's clear as day to see, while most of Richard's issues and drama online related to his own passions, stubbornness, an argumentative nature. This time, he was a victim of his own past and not of the actions he was currently taking. The Rally for Sally movement, in case you're wondering, all kind of fell apart after this. Um, through a few main things, I mean, the first thing was people found out Kuda was involved, which, yes, it did have an impact on it. A two, then Kuda had this big grand rant, which people then pointed to, and, you know, people made videos about it and what have you. And then three, Koji took complete control over the Rally for Sally Twitter account, which, again, was supposed to be, like, a joint account, but the uh, Alex Hedgefox was trying to get him like cut out, but didn't do it correctly. And so somehow Koji locked all of them out and decided to use the account exclusively to dunk on Richard Kuda some more, ensuring whatever progress was made for the Rally for Sally movement was sacrificed for the ritualistic slaughter of a dead horse long over decayed. Kuda also admitted to faking an email from Sega where they confirmed that they own Sally Acorn as well, apologizing for that frankly dumb thing to lie about since it's already been confirmed in the past. Uh, but all the same, the damage was clearly done. Not just for Sally, even getting into the game, but for everyone involved. None more than Kuda, of course. Why do you keep 
or kept going away and then coming back to the Sonic slash Satam fandom. What kept you coming back? <laughs> That's the funny enigma that is the Sonic franchise. I, I have so many other properties I'm a fan of, but there, there's just something so alluring with Sonic. I, I really can't explain it. The, the way how unpredictable Sega has been in the, like, the last decade and how they're, they've been handling the games, it's almost like a train wreck. Like your curiosity gets the best of you because you just can't look away from the abominations and jarring decisions that they've made. From like Sonic 06 to even the repulsive design that was initially advertised for the Sonic movie. It, it's like, like a beautiful disaster. <laughs> Where, where you expect the worst, but still hold on to this delusion that things are improving. And it's it's really depressing, because back in the 90s and early 2000s, Sonic wasn't viewed as the joke as he is today. I mean, you have all these memes and self-deprecating humor that stem from Sega embracing their failures, which is horrible. And, and it's an unprofessional way of presenting themselves as a company. So basically, it's just a, hey, a new Sonic game was announced, I wonder how bad this one will be. And that's the mentality myself and so many other fans have adapted. This battered wife syndrome. We hate the abuse, but just keep coming back for more. As someone who has gone through a lot online, has been known as a rather infamous figure, what perspective do you have to share with everyone watching this video? Hmm. I have to say that the internet is a very cruel and unforgiving mistress. <laughs> Whenever you post, no matter how petty or irrelevant it is today, it will never, it will never be forgotten. It will bite you on the ass because it's perplexing how there's still people out there who will throw shade at me based on shit that happened well over a decade ago. So I guess my advice is to really think about what you post before hitting that submit button, be it text or video or if the actions you take is going to have some type of adverse effects. Because in this day and age of cancel culture and platforms like Twitter policing everyone, anything you say or do will have some type of consequence. And it's very unfortunate because nobody deserves to be endlessly harassed or ridiculed when they've obviously, you know, they're not the same person anymore. I, I feel that it's unfair to hold a grudge against someone when they've taken the necessary effort to change. And unfortunately, I'm still kind of fighting that battle. Any regrets? I'd say many. <laughs> oh man, uh, don't we all just wish we had a reset button we could just press when needed? Uh, I guess if I had the ability to waste time, I'd probably inform my younger self that getting aggressive over a cartoon hedgehog isn't worth jeopardizing friendships and job opportunities over. Um, you know, hiring people on a project without verifying their credentials is probably another. I don't know, there's just so much I could list, but overall, it's just human nature to make mistakes. But it's, it's how we learn from them that allows us to grow and flourish to become better people. And that's what I truly believe in. I'll ask once more, what does it mean to be a fool? Maybe it's as simple as slipping on the proverbial banana in front of others, others being the ones to fully determine foolishness. But surely, they won't laugh at the slip up forever. What are those fools whose embarrassment is long lasting, perhaps even eternal? What makes one want to document and take interest in those who have failed? Could it be that the slip up was that funny? Maybe it was that they kept falling time and time again. Maybe their enemies made sure no one ever forgot their mistakes. Or maybe it's not even the slip up itself at some point, but rather simply slipping in just the right place at the right time. A banana placed by the hand of fate, you might say. In truth, 
When looking at the case of Richard Kuda, this sonic sad I am loving, at times diaper wearing, cringy, foolish, yet also passionate, and above all else, stubborn, now over 40 year old man, can I say that his story is all that crazy compared to others? These days, a sonic fan who wears diapers is, well, all but normal in this jaded world we call the internet. Compared to the crazy exploits, scandals, and even pure evil of the individuals the internet takes interest in now. Richard, in all honesty, isn't all that much of a story. And yet here I am making a long ass video about it. So then, why does his name hold such weight in the Sonic community? Why would someone like me make this long video about him? Why does his mere presence call others to action to cancel and call him out in projects he's in? Why do others fear being considered friends with this man? Is he such a disgusting freak that he deserves this ridicule? If he were never discovered back when the internet was far fresher, and were only discovered now, would the attraction to this story be as strong? I can't say for sure, but what I can say for certain is Richard can never escape his past, no matter how much he tries, from hiding from it, to embracing it, to apologizing about it, to trying to set out a new future and thus maybe a new past for himself. It seems what they say is true. The internet truly never forgets. Such is the hand of fate, this time being a fool in the internet age, it would seem. So, perhaps what it truly means to be a fool, a specific action must be taken. The action to keep fooling oneself. To try and go against the hand of fate. To change people's perception of you. In the face of so many failures, to try and redeem oneself. But then, can one blame a person for trying? Who holds all the aces in the hands of fate? Is one doomed to repeat the cycle forever after? Is 10 years not enough? I wonder if 20 years would be enough. 30? 40? How about when the man is dead? Would it be enough then? It's clear as day for anyone to see that Kuda has made many, many mistakes in his time online. He shared far too much of himself. Every embarrassing detail shared for all those to see and mock as they may. He was perhaps too ambitious in his projects. And while I would never look down upon a man for giving something his all and failing, I don't think Kuda would have ever been regarded as a locale of sorts. He is without those diaper accounts, as well as that green-eyed Sonic video. Of course, Kuda also made the mistake of further showcasing his diaper hobbies online and accounts for years before he finally realized what a mistake that was. He gave the trolls too often exactly what they wanted, a reaction. He was too often surrounded by those who didn't have his best interest in mind. In fact, it was the reason his entire stories and escapades were ever documented on ED to begin with. Still, one thing I can say about Kuda, that he himself noted in his rant, that I believe objectively holds true through our whole story, is that Kuda has never went out of his way to hurt others. He never maliciously took down other people's videos, went on sneaky ops to screw people over, he never tried to sue people, he never tried to groom anyone, he never blackmailed people. No, in truth, Kuda's story is a tale of one man's foolish ambitions placing a spotlight upon him. He has only ever truly hurt himself at the end of the day. Whether he deserves it or not, others will continue to follow him and mock him and document him never letting him forget the past. And hell, I'm self-reflective enough to say that this video, in a way, is kind of doing that itself. Putting a spotlight on Kuda's story, perhaps more so than anything else has in the past. Kuda's persona, no matter what he does, is forever marred by the mistakes of 10 years ago. Because online, the past is only one click away from being the present, forever doomed in the endless cycle of the internet's all-seeing eyes. But, what if it didn't have to be that way? A 
A few months later, after the whole Rally for Sally drama had passed, Kuda and the other people involved eventually came around and put their differences aside and made up with one another. This last year, Kuda turned 40. In fact, by the time this video comes out, he should be about 41. And with that came time for him to reflect upon everything he had done up to this point. Some long over enemies he's had for years he went out of his way to bury the hatchet with. He tossed aside the old rich monk name he had for a few years up to this point and decided to focus more on his normal life, away from the internet. He still has stuff he does, of course, but you might say it's no longer a focus for him these days. And therein lies perhaps the answer to the greatest riddle ever told. How does one escape the all-seeing eyes of the internet, the place where the past is always the present? The future is but opportunities for the past to be the present evermore. How does a man who slipped on a banana on such a grand stage, bigger than any other in the face of mankind, win back the audience? Simple. Get off the stage. It's not as if I'm saying something groundbreaking by making the observation that we're living in an era when the internet is so deeply rooted and connected with people's lives. It becomes harder and harder to separate reality from the meta-reality of the net that seems to pull us all into its black void. We know we can't live without it. We know in many ways it's probably pretty fucking bad for us to stare at the white and dark themed colored text boxes, videos and like for the majority of our day. And yet, here we are. Cursed by the hand of fate, you might say, to live amongst the generation in which this is so easily accessible. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, of course. I think there are some positives that have come from the internet. Hell, it's never been easier to circumvent the systems of the old world, share your stories, art, films, games, etc. out to a world to truly express yourself in a way that one could only dream of 40 or 50 years ago. But all the same, something certainly can be learned from Kuda's tale. That the internet is both the easiest gig that you'll ever be able to walk onto, as well as the easiest you can walk off of. After all, it is as easy as hitting the power button either way. In this era, I think it's easy to forget that. Especially since most of us probably grew up alongside the internet and legitimately don't know how we would function without it. Especially those of us who have shared so much of ourselves online, or in cases like Kuda, shared far too much. It's easy to tell people to go outside and touch grass, but you know damn well you're gonna go back in and start touching your touchscreen, keyboard, or controller before long. Richard Kuda's tale is interesting to me because it comes from the era before the internet was so centralized. Before before it was literally everywhere, which reveals to me at least that none of us are exactly prepared for when a mob of people don't like us. Something which would have been pretty hard to do before the internet existed, unless you're like a celebrity or a politician or something. Hell, to be candid, I myself have experienced quite a mob of people who didn't and more than likely don't like me after I first made my Rise and Fall of AVGN video. I knew it would be controversial admittingly, I knew many would take issue with the length, the title, the editing to get through Screenwave's copyright, and the opinions I shared there in it. But I did it anyway, because I'm passionate about it, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I wonder if that in turn makes me a bit of an internet fool. Hell, trusting YouTube as a platform as my main source of income might be called a rather uh, foolish by some, or even many. I guess the point I'm trying to get across is, looking at the whole picture, I think we all sort of use this void we call the internet in kind of foolish ways sometimes, through one means or another. And that's okay, so long as we can reflect upon it and be okay with that, with taking that risk, with pushing forward into the future anyway. In that way, I don't think Richard Kuda, despite his infamy, is all that bad of a guy. I mean, I'll never understand the fucking diaper stuff, and he has posted some majorly cringy shit that I think I've shown in full here over the years. But if I'm being totally objective, Kuda is just kind of a weird guy who tried to make cool stuff for the Sonic community. He fucked up and then people never let it go after. It's a shame Kuda's Sad AM film failed. 
It's a shame it failed again with the fan project part of it as well. If you look at fan projects these days, such as reanimated films slash episodes or projects like A Fox in Space, it's clear these days that these types of projects are far more successful and have people on board for them far quicker. Of course, these are either projects with hundreds of artists working together on it or in A Fox in Space's case, a really fucking dedicated dude who has decided to dedicate his life to making the coolest cartoon ever. So they aren't exact copies of what Kuda was trying to do back then. But it would also be ignorant to deny that Kuda was sort of a forerunner with this idea to make a fan film. Uh, there were others as well, but his was definitely a major case of one. So much so that no one really took him seriously at the time as wasn't really something people did. The most you found were little cartoon animations on Newgrounds and stuff, but a whole film? I mean, that's still something you don't really even see to this day. Anytime Kuda has been involved with a creative project, he has put his money and time where his mouth is, however, which is, at the very least, far more than I can say about other projects. Sure, he failed, but I personally admire the effort in spite of the end result. Even his stubborn nature, with no one wanting or caring about his film, being ridiculed everywhere he went, it speaks both to his irrational stubbornness, which got him into this mess, but also his unyielding passion and devotion. It's a bit of a double-edged sword, I suppose. I feel like if he applied those skills to something a little more tangible, maybe he would have actually gotten somewhere. But as it stands, it's is what it is. But then once again, that is the crux of our tale. Had Richard succeeded, this would have been the epic story of an underdog succeeding above all else, above all odds, above everyone who doubted him. Call me a sucker or a fan of cliches, but I do love those types of stories. But as our tale stands, it's instead the far less told, but far more common tale of the underdog failing in spite of their best efforts. What is your final message to anyone that sees this, and what have you been up to currently, creatively slash professionally? I'd probably say the same message I could echo from Ben Hurst. You know, stay persistent in your goals, keep chasing your dreams, make improvements in your life, and don't let setbacks deter your aspirations. A as for my own, I, I basically freelance, mostly in the music industry, designing album covers, posters, and flyers. You know, like, various types of merch for, like, local rock bands. But that was actually how I got my start as a graphic designer way back in college. But it's always been a profession I've held, a, held an affinity with. And uh, aside from that, I've taken contract roles networking with major tech companies by creating marketing deliverables for products and services. But uh, aside from graphic design, I've utilized my free time to learn UX, UI design, hand illustration, and even cooking. But you know, if somehow people are interested in checking out my work, they could visit me at athirstybottle.net or search me under the name Ricky Chip on DeviantArt. It's not the end of the world if you mess up online. We all mess up or make people mad. And in those moments, we all just gotta remember that the stage, the banana, the mistake, it's all just still a fucking metaphor. None of it is truly real. And so long as you're not hurting anybody, which as far as I know, Kuda is not well known for, I think it's okay to pick yourself up and not let it all get you down. Kuda is a man who has made many mistakes. But so too is he someone who has time and time again tried to make up for them, create something for everyone to enjoy, and then been completely and utterly humiliated online, sometimes by his own hands, sometimes by others. And whether you personally think he deserves every bit of hate he gets or not, the lesson is still all the same. Don't let the internet control your whole life. Emotions, passions, and sense of self. Learn from your mistakes and move on. Apply that passion towards the next thing. Don't share so much of yourself if you're not able to handle what others will surely say of it. Don't waste your time trying to win over a crowd who already hates you. Sometimes you just need to find a new one. It's not always all your fault. And above all else, if, or perhaps, when the time comes, 
when the fool in the room, the one everyone is mocking, the one who's slipped on the banana, is finally you. Take some time to self-reflect so that you don't make that mistake again. Or else, you'll forget that the void that seems so much more than yourself, the darkness that slowly but eagerly envelops you, is so much less than who you really are. Rich monkeys, 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 r